It's 8 o'clock on today. Coming up, evacuations underway. The border from Gaza into Egypt now open. Ambulances seen carrying out the first evacuees. What it means for those looking to get out, including some Americans. We're live on the ground with the latest. Then cabin confrontation this morning. New details emerging about a pilot charged after allegedly threatening to shoot the captain mid-flight. Tom Costello has the story straight ahead. Plus, joining forces, Katie Couric and Jean Trebek are teaming up to raise awareness for a cause that's close to their hearts. I think this really coincides with his character, his spirit of helping others and, and finding the right answers. How they're honoring their loved ones and searching for a cure straight ahead. And all dressed up after we rocked the plaza. We're taking a look at the craziest and most creative celebrity Halloween costumes. The Tricks and Treats coming up in Pop Start today, Wednesday, November 1st, 2023. On a girl's trip to celebrate our graduation. Sending love to my parents watching in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Visiting from, from Swanee, Georgia. Georgia. East Greenwich, Rhode Island. And, and Westwood, Massachusetts. We get in a truck and out of way. From Claremont, California. Migration to New York. I flew 926 miles to come to the Today Show. Welcome back. November is Pancreatic Cancer Awareness Month. Every year, more than 60,000 people are diagnosed and 50,000 will die of the disease. The cancer is notoriously difficult to detect, and the five-year survival rate for pancreatic cancer is just 12%. In 2019, Alex Trebek, the beloved longtime host of Jeopardy!, told the world he, too, had been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And America watched as he fought the disease with courage and with grace and continued to work on the show right until his final days. Well, now Alex's wife, Jean, has joined forces with Stand Up to Cancer to support scientists working on better screening and treatment options for pancreatic cancer. And she joined some of Alex's colleagues to remember his public and private battle in a new video announcing the fund. Take a look. People were shocked and right away they were sending so many notes, so many emails, so many sweet gifts. Jeopardy was uh, such an important thing in his life, you know, that no matter how he was feeling, no matter how rough the treatments were, he could come in here and he would still be Alex Trebek. Alex would go back in the dressing room in a state that no one would think someone could come out and host Jeopardy. And sure enough, Alex would come out as if nothing had happened. While Jean Trebek is with us now, along with one of Stand Up co-founders co and a familiar face, Katie Couric. Good morning to both of you, mm. ladies. Thanks, Hi, Savannah. Savannah. It's so good to see you, Jean. It's you hard too. to look back on, on those moments. And um, Alex was so, so brave. How are, You have yeah. been brave. It's been three years almost. I know. It's been three years. I cannot believe the time has gone by so fast. Um, How are Matthew and Emily, your kids, doing? How are you guys doing? You know, it has been certainly a transition for us. I think Alex represented such a great structure for our family and just, you know, recreating ourselves without this this fabulous presence that really guided us a lot. So, yeah, but we're good. It's, we are good. It, it's hard to learn how to be a new family, which some, in yeah. some ways that happens when you lose someone. Of course, right. you lost your sister Emily to pancreatic cancer. You have been a warrior on this, Katie, for so, so long. How did you get to know Jean and how did this fund come about? Well, when Alex was diagnosed, I reached out to the Jeopardy team just to say, I have access to a lot of scientists and researchers and volunteering to help in any way I could. And of course, I've known Alex through the years. We co-hosted this Cherry Blossom Festival Parade in Washington, mm -hmm. D.C. That was a number of years ago. And, you know, I, I loved and revered him like everyone else. So. Uh, when he lost his battle with pancreatic cancer, I reached out to Jean because having lost my husband, Jay, I really understood what it was like to lose someone you love so much and to actually watch them suffer through this disease. So we just got to be friends and I just wanted to support her in any way I could. And we started talking about 
Alex's legacy and how we could honor him. And that's when the idea of this fund came, came well, about. I, I have to think that Alex would just love this because he was such a learner. He was so into science. Yeah. What does it mean to you, Jean, to, to be part of this, this work in Alex's honor and to, and to Matthew and Emily, your kids? Yeah, I think we're really uh, glad to support finding a cure. This was something that Alex actually would champion. He loved a good challenge. He was very curious. He loved to know the answers, both at Jeopardy and at home. <laughs> and I think this really coincides with his character, his spirit of helping others and and finding the right answers. Yeah, and yeah. You, I in the form of a question. In the, in, oh, yes, exactly. yeah. Always in the form of a question. Uh, you also have done this fund in honor of Barbara Hanania. She was a cinematographer who died of the disease. Tell me about her and what that contribution is. Well, her estate has been has made a very significant donation as well. Jean launched the fund, and obviously we want to grow it because we want to support as much science as we can, and so their contribution has been wonderful. And then I'm making a, a donation in honor of my sister, Emily, who you mentioned died at just 54 mm -hmm. of pancreatic cancer as she was on the cusp of a, of a brilliant political career in the state of Virginia. There's hope on the horizon. What are some of the things that you've learned about that you're excited about? Well, there, you know, I think with all cancer, the uh, big area is liquid biopsies, which is a fancy way of saying a blood test, which can really recognize microscopic cells and get cancer at a very early stage. That's hard with pancre pancreatic because the pancreas is very insulated and it, it doesn't spill a lot of DNA into the blood. So that's a challenge. But also vaccines are really exciting, really um, educating the immune system to recognize pancreatic, pancreatic cancer and, re, and, and sort of reawakening it to fight the disease. So there are a number of vaccines on the horizon. And with AI, I think we're gonna be hearing much more about personalized vaccines. So it's a very exciting time, but we, you know, science takes money and that's why we're estab establishing this fund. Well, Jean, you yeah. contributed mightily on behalf of Alex. Is there a part of this where when you're able to just put some purpose to mm -hmm. the pain that you've been through, is that healing or comforting in oh, any way? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think, Doing something creative or proactive really helps the healing journey. So uh, I can't thank Katie enough for spearheading this with me, but really you have been the, the genius behind this. I don't know yes, about that, you but are. you know, I mean, I think that it is very cathartic, Savannah, when you experience a tremendous loss and feel so powerless in the face of a disease like this to channel your energies into, you know, supporting science that will prevent it from happening to other families, hopefully one day. I mean, having gone, lost your, your husband, Jay, so young as well, you've made right. it your life's mission. You've done such good work. I feel like I've hit yeah. every organ, colon, <laughs> breast, now the pancreas. <laughs> and Listen, keep going. I just want to mention, if people want to contribute, Savannah, yeah. they can go to standuptocancer.org backslash the Alex Trebek Fund. Jeopardy is going to be promoting this, so you're not going to be able to get away from <laughs> our talking about this fund. And November 8th is also the third anniversary of Alex's death. Yeah, so next week. It's so a great way to honor him. Yes, I hope people will. And you can find more information about pan pancreatic cancer. It's on our website, today.com. Ladies, thank you. Thanks, thank Savannah. You.
an amazing yeah. crowd yeah. out here. Yeah. Uh, a little rain. Slow rain. We don't, we don't care. No big deal. We don't no. care. Somebody, Slow somebody, wait, somebody stole her phone. Can you bring her phone back to us? <laughs> you got your phone? I mean, you flew 926 miles. Wait, from where? Wait. Wait, are we really long lost twins? Yeah, Hold on. Nice to meet. Let's uh, see. Like Hold on. Uh, 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 that's good. Two gorgeous You're ladies. Like my daughter. I love Do you. people say that a lot? You look like Hoda? A lot. A lot. <laughs> well, that's a compliment. Yeah, yeah. I, I, oh, yeah. God, I love you. Here. Thank at least, you for at least get a reservation out of it at a nice Yeah, place. exactly. <laughs> use, your, use your power for evil. Yes, yes. <laughs> Guys, we have really big news to share. Oh, yeah. One yeah. week from today. K-pop sensation Jungkook will be what? taking over the plaza for a live concert. Wow. You guys, just fair warning. Yes. It's going to be packed. It'll be insane. It's going to be insane. This could be the yeah. biggest no idea yeah. how big that's going to be. Yeah. 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 Are you sure BTS? Know this, right? People don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Magic. That's going right. to be huge. Don't beat yes. Uh, but he does have a solo career that's going off huge right now. Uh, smashing all sorts of records. I don't know if we're playing it. I think we're playing seven. One of his big hits right now. Just reached a billion streams on Spotify. Uh, probably the quickest to get to that mark in history. It's going to be an insane performance. Yeah. Yeah. Join us. It's next Wednesday, November 8th. Wow. Right here. So. That'll be good. Welcome back. Two of Hollywood's biggest stars are sharing the screen. There's a new film coming out this Friday. It's called What Happens Later. I am talking about Meg Ryan and David Duchovny. They play exes who reunite kind of unexpectedly for the first time in more than 20 years when they become stranded overnight in an airport. It kind of forces them to confront a whole host of unresolved issues. Take a look. You okay? You're limping. Oh, it's just a, you know, it's a little thing with my hip. What little thing? Old peopleness, right? Arthritis. Oh, okay. I have 49. Okay. I have to say, I'm, I'm really 49, surprised I have it. Huh? Yeah. Uh huh. Well, we're the same age. That's right. And you, you've moved well into your 50s mm -hmm. by now, right? You just pulled over at 49. Oh yeah, yeah. You yeah. Stop the clock. Yeah, sure. I've been 49 forever and ever and wow, ever. Wow, lucky you. Mm -hmm. I feel like I've been in my 50s since my 20s. <laughs> oh what? my God, that is so true. <laughs> you don't have to agree with me. I never thought of it that way. That's exactly right. <laughs> I feel like those are your real personalities. Like, I feel like I'm watching you guys just in action. <laughs> That's the well, trick. Megan, David, good morning. First of all, we have to say we haven't had a lot of uh, actors and actresses in because of the SAG strike, but sure. you guys are able to be here. Will you just Yes, we yeah. just yeah. SAG that? for that. Yeah. yeah. What, yeah. what, how did that work out? They gave you like kind of a waiver? We have a yeah. waiver. Okay. Because uh, the company that we made it with and is bringing it out is not a struck company. Okay, so, got it. Yeah. Got it. Okay, so this is very cool. First of all, Meg, you wrote, directed, starred in it. Co wrote. Co wrote. Yes. You didn't initially want to star no. in it yourself. Who were you thinking about? playing your character. Uh, apparently it's bad form to say that. <laughs> oh, it is? <laughs> yeah, but we didn't get her. Yeah, yeah. And so we had to have me. <laughs> and then, then we got it's David. It's not bad form to talk about all was the other David, guys no. that you was wanted Was David your first me. choice? Yes. Absolutely not. And if, not, yes. if David said no, who would you have been looking for? I can't, for? I really can't say. She would not have made the movie. No, really? she would not have done it. Okay. I feel like we need a rom-com, Meg. I feel like the timing of this yeah. is perfect. Yeah, and it, ha it is. It is. A, I was. I actually think of it as a love story with rom com elements. Oh. It's definitely fun, but it's. It's. Yeah. A, how about you, David? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what would you say? I think you know it. it it's. It has a, a bit of melancholy to it because it's. It, we're older, yeah. you know. And we're looking yeah. back at love in a way and rediscovering it. So. There's a lot of different vectors in the film. It's not just like the bloom of first love, but it's oh, it's is. almost like a remembrance of that and also a re-blooming, which is not a word, but... It is, it now. is now. Yes, it is now. So when Meg called and said, I'd like you to do this, were you an instant yes? Yes, of course. Yeah, before yeah. the script or just... Um, I think probably, yeah, probably it was, yeah. I don't but know. I did read the script and then we talked and, and we yeah. kind of workshopped it together for a long time on Zoom. We would just read over the script yeah. with one another. Talk around it, talk about it, talk about our lives, talk yeah. about the script. And then it sort of evolved and evolved and evolved. The characters evolved, the situation evolved. There's a whole magical element in the movie that evolved oh. a magical reality. Yeah. How is it? Um, directing someone who is such an accomplished actor. I mean, do you say, David, I've got notes? She wouldn't know. You don't know. She wouldn't know. <laughs> I don't know. She doesn't really I, know. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you don't, actually. You, you don't? Know? And there's just, you know. You don't, want to, you don't uh, direct me? No. I'm, 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 no, I'm undirectable. You're undirectable? No, yeah. he doesn't need it. So wait, tell, but, okay, you tell me, what was Meg like as a director? When, when she needed something changed, how did she explain that to you? You know, it, it, 
the the gift was she was also acting with me. So I think ah. some sometimes she kind of direct acted. You know, like mm -hmm. she, if it was a change or, or or just a change in feeling that she wanted, I think she would act it. And because we're reactive actors, we're very reactive. I, I seem to be saying the same word over and over. Uh -huh. um, that she would manipulate me, not manipulate in that way, but you know, kind of move me into a different area. It, kind of I was, think. it was Is really right? fun. No, <laughs> because we what was fun about it for me yeah. is like when you're directing, you have a micromanage, yeah. micromanaging mind when yeah. you're and my character is a really loose and kind of very flaky. Yeah. And it was a relief to kind of play her. He plays a um, David plays a much more cons kind of like conservative Uptight. guy. So what we weren't able to look at playback or anything like that. So when I got to the editing room, I could see what David was doing. <laughs> That's what you do. Like behind her back. Like behind my back. <laughs> I love how y'all shot this in a real functioning airport. Yeah. yeah. Like there was, like, were these, the, yeah. the, they weren't extras. These were people no. who were we going to the airport. some extras, but for the most part, we shot in Northwest Arkansas, and there yeah. were days where we had to use the real folks in the airport. So how did that work? We not, just not had to so wing well. it. How? Not like, so no. Well. No, you would have people talk to us in the middle of our long walk and right. talk. So yeah. we'd just try to ignore them and yeah. hope that they weren't on. And, like, I really just hope for the best. But and and like we Meg would do Ryan it. Over here. <laughs> like, okay, that takes not not so good. Now. Maybe we won't use that. But we would do <laughs> eight minute long takes, and oh, it was yeah. fun. I love those days. Yeah. What do you think about finding love later in life, for real? Oh. No, we never thought about that. We made a whole movie about it. Yeah. These guys are looking back. These guys are looking back trying to make sense of a life actually not lived with one another, and yeah. they have this sort of, yeah. sort of subtextual question, which I think pe may, people might be able to relate to, which is why didn't you love me enough? Why didn't we? Uh -huh. yeah. Why didn't it work? And they kind of connect and disconnect and connect again, and it's the story of that. I think what's fascinating about it is that we we broke up when we were in college. And we broke up for specific reasons, but it turns out that those reasons were kind of false assumptions. Yeah, they were wrong. And then we lived our lives almost in reaction to, you know, I'm not going to do that again. Right. Yeah. And, and then, then to come back and found out yeah. the truth. Yeah. 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 They got. They finally get their facts straight. Yeah. I can't believe this is the first time you guys have worked together. I know. I know. It's beautiful. We've been I waiting know. for this rom com. <laughs> it comes out when Friday. <laughs> This Friday? Yeah, Friday, yeah. <laughs> All right. Mm -hmm. Meg Ryan, David Duchovny, thank you guys for stopping by. Thanks, Oda. What happens later? This is in theaters on Friday. Again, thanks, guys. We are back, 844. We've got today best sellers and this morning affordable fall favorites from fashion to beauty to home improvement. We've got it all. Our guide is Shop Today editorial director Adriana Brock, and you can shop everything you see. Just simply scan our QR code. Adriana, good morning. Hey, good morning. Okay, fall favorites. This looks like a warm, cozy fall favorite. shirt. These are best sellers that our team has tried and loved. And 
They're great. They're going to take you through your wardrobe, your beauty routine, and your home routine. So getting started with this corduroy short shirt, right now it's all about the shacket. I don't know if you've heard about this trend. No, it's the shacket. It combines the best of both worlds, a jacket and a shirt. Okay. So it's a little bit more, I see. more heavyweight than your typical button-down shirt. But you can layer it, which is really good this time of year when the weather's sort of transitioning. Now, what's the bottom like? Because the bottom, it's a oh, little just bit like a regular old shirt. Yeah, it's okay. a regular shirt. It's okay. tucked in because it's a mannequin. But it, it. it is a little bit longer. It hits along the hip, which okay. is great to pair with like leggings, your jeans. You wear a tank top underneath or a we'll long sleeve shirt. Yeah. You leave it open. Layer friendly, which we love for fall. Okay. Now you said these pants are better than leggings, which I kind of get because sometimes you don't want to put on those tight leggings. Yeah. Sometimes you you don't want to be restricted. You right. want a little bit of movement. Move, uh, range of motion yeah. and these are really great our editor Julie found these because she was browsing through Amazon she saw that these had 20,000 reviews and said I have to check them out and she took them to the Grand Canyon to go hiking oh, okay. over the summer but these are also really great for just like running errands everyday activity they've got deep pockets you can fit your phone and your wallet and keys they've got the tapered legs so they're gonna stay put and like you said, they're not as tight as your legging. They're a little bit roomier, but they feel just as nice and soft as yeah. your favorite legging. So this is a great alternative for a comfy, cozy look. Yeah, or yoga. I, would like, yoga. I like yoga pants like that. Yeah, or Put even if you're like going out for a walk. Yes. Easy peasy. All right, now what the heck is this? Okay, so this is a fabric shaver. Now that we're all busting out our sweaters for the fall. Okay. You don't throw away those sweaters that are pilling and have a oh, little yeah, bit of all lint. Bally and weird. Yeah, yeah, they're okay. a little bit weird. Don't throw them out. Here's an easy way to preserve their life okay. is with this fabric shaver from Conair. Super popular, and we love it because you can use it really on anything from a sweater to a pair of leggings. Can you show us? Yes, let me show you. It's so simple to use. I think we have a before and after of one of our producers who tried it too. And it doesn't hurt the fabric? It doesn't hurt the fabric. It's really, wow. yeah, you could actually see the difference on that one. It's really good. Get rid of the lint, the fuzz, all that like, huh? It's and it's just so easy and affordable. It is. Yeah. And Eleven ninety seven. I know. I love using this too on like a upholstery too around the house. Oh, like on your fabric. couch or something. Yeah, oh. or like a pillow and stuff. Okay. Really easy way to refresh your fabrics. Okay. And speaking of easy. Crep spray. I'm obsessed with this. I've like waxed on what about is... this forever. <laughs> this is to protect your shoes from water, like snow, and oh, a little okay. bit of My dirt too. My always look terrible by the yes, end of the. These are Christmas. great, not just yeah. for your uh, like cheerling line boots, but also for leather canvas, your sneakers, yes, those, your leather boots that you're gonna wear all fall long. This is great because you just spray it on. I will say spray it on outside is my number one tip because okay. it's very strong scent. But it's going to protect your shoes for about five to six weeks, according to the brand. So spray once. So you don't have to spray every day or no, whatever. No, you don't have to oh. do it every day. You do this once a month. Here, I did it on one of my pair of boots. Literally ran it under the water so you guys could see how great it repels water. Oh, it really does. Yeah, it creates a hydrophobic layer around the boot yeah. kind of like an invisible raincoat are you spraying at close range like this or um just like... i'd say like around like five inches away okay. but get a good coating in i yes. like to do two coats for okay. like the extra and again say for the not going to change the color or anything it's not going to change the color it there it is limited on fabric so i would say check the label but sure, it's canvas yeah. leather your typical boot fabrics okay yeah now, what do we have? Okay, here? we're going to refresh our beauty routine. Now, you've heard of retinol, which is derm an yes. ingredient dermatologists swear by. And this kind of combines the best of both worlds with a retinol and an eye serum Ooh. into a stick form. So this is what you're going to use under your eyes to help depuff, smooth the skin. And it's reduce, gentle enough for under eyes. It's gentle enough. The retinol okay. is gentle enough to use under your eyes. I also really like it because it's moisturizing. Yeah. I mean, it's literally like a, a serum and stick form. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so it feels like a little chapsticky kind of. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And who doesn't like an easy hack for their beauty routine, okay. right? Okay. Would you do that at night or, or day? I would do it morning. at night. Okay. Night. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. I've tried this before. Okay. This is a lip mask, right? This is a lip mask yeah, I like that you this. put on overnight, especially now when we're getting chapped lips, mm -hmm. dry lips. But I also really like using it as a lip balm. Oh, Every okay. day, it comes in this great little jar, and a little bit goes a long way. So it is a little bit pricier from Tatcha. It's $29. Oh, yeah. But you're going to use a little bit and great get great results, and it's going to last you all season long. Okay, great. Yeah. Perfect. And then I, I love how, is this still, are we still in beauty over here? Or no, we we're to, moving on to home. Okay, I was like, I okay. don't know how you put that on your face. Okay, okay home so improvement. This is home improvement. These are little sconces, and they're really cool because you mount them onto the wall, totally wireless, and they've got a magnetic attachment for oh. the actual light. So this is great for accent lighting around the home in like Cute. hallways, bathrooms, by your nightstand. So then you take it off and charge it. You take it off and charge it. According to the brand, one charge will last you up to eight hours if you're 
if you have this on continuously, you can also put it on auto mode for oh. up to 30 days. The battery will last. Okay. Really cool for motion detection too, if you want that in your oh. bathroom, again, around the house. I personally love it because I can use this as a nightlight. Oh yeah. Take it off. Go around. Lightsaber. Lightsaber. Yeah. How do you mount it? Is it difficult to um, mount? It's an adhesive strip. Oh, so you can so use a command. Easy. Yeah. Oh, so love easy. that. Oh my gosh, yeah. leaf floor. My husband loves okay. leaf blower. This is awesome because it's under thirty-five dollars. Okay. And nobody wants to rake leaves these days, no. right? Especially when you have people you coming over for Thanksgiving. You want to blow them into the neighbor's yard. No, I'm just kidding. No, don't blow them into I your can't, neighbor's I can't. yard. <laughs> but you can blow them onto your sidewalk. Create a nice little easy pile. This is great because it's under $35 and Black & Decker says it reaches speeds up to 180 miles per hour with if you want to crank it on oh. which can is we demo like, it or is like it a hurricane in? it's plugged in you could try it oh I my mean gosh. check wow. this out watch out everyone standing yeah. over there total game changer wow do, it does all the chores for you, so okay. you don't have to do it, and cool. you don't have to rake the leaves this, this fall. Adriana, thank you. That was fun. You have a little real variety there. I know. We, ha we ran the gamut today. Yeah. So if you want to buy any of these items, you can scan the QR code or go to today.com slash shop. Today does earn a commission from purchases made through our links. We're back in a moment. This is Today on NBC. I love the heavy machinery. I think we left just enough time to do some birthdays. Yes. Oh, always time for that. Let's bring on the newest batch of those smuckers jars and see who we got pasted on there. First up, we've got a happy 105th birthday to Evelyn Gerard of Southington, Connecticut. Secret to her longevity, a glass of red wine. Ida Cox of Winterville, North Carolina is 100, a proud mom of 10, loves mentoring her grandkids and great grandkids. Happy 100th birthday to Tony Cugno, a retired engineer from Santa Rosa Beach, Florida. He says the secret to longevity, always try to learn new things. Way to go. Fred Hoffman is from Mamaroneck, New York, a Purple Heart veteran celebrating 100 years. We celebrate you for your service, sir. He and his wife love to hit the road, travel together, and their family can't get them to slow down. You guys keep on going. Heading now to Big Stone Gap, Virginia, Maxine Shelton. 102, getting the whole family together to honor her special day. We know it's going to be a great one. And last but certainly not least, happy 75th anniversary to Joe and Ann Bickler. Love birds from Fargo, North Dakota. You betcha. Their granddaughter says to this day they are the most in love couple she knows. That is sweet 75, 75 years wow. wow by the way today the kids all trick-or-treated last night we're, uh -huh. ha we're having the kids pick out their 10 favorite pieces of candy yeah and then the rest of the candy local organizations have this uh we're saying it to the troops overseas oh fantastic there's, what a great people, idea people that's good do that today. yeah, yeah. there's I lots of those that. programs out there that's okay great. cool see daily uh don't go anywhere folks third hour of today coming up in just a few minutes we're going to catch up with shaka khan then we're going to catch up with lavar burton as well and then on our fourth hour music superstar usher oh, will be here Super in Bowl studio yeah we've yeah. got a lot to talk about but first a check of your local news and weather this morning on the third hour of today touching tribute the creators of Friends opening up about the loss of Matthew Perry. He was in a 
really good place, which is why this seems so unfair. Their memories of the beloved actor and message to his fans. Then later, the countdown is on. The Queen of Christmas declaring the holiday season is here as we learn about this year's Rockefeller Center Christmas tree. And we have another holiday reveal brewing as well. Plus, music legend Chaka Khan Chaka Khan live in Studio 1A. Looking back on her iconic 50-year career and the huge honor she's receiving this weekend. And Dear Diary, author Jeff Kinney is here live. The diary of a wimpy kid creator sharing great fall reads for kids and adults. Today, Wednesday, November 1st, 2023. Live from Studio 1A in Rockefeller Plaza, this is the third hour of today. Good morning and welcome to the third hour of today. We have our whole team here and of course, our sister cousin Yay. to the show. Yes. Sister cousin. I like it. Sounds like a weird thing. Sister cousin sounds like a weird thing. But anyway, Hoda's here uh, joining us to share a really powerful and emotional conversation about beloved actor Matthew Perry. And you had the chance to sit down with the creators of Friends. Yeah, after we did our Halloween special, uh, I got a chance to sit down with them. And they were really amazing. Marta Kaufman and David Crane. They spent so many years working with Matthew Perry. And they said they told me they were still processing the loss. But they did take a moment to talk with me exclusively. You said that um, at the Friends reunion you, you were concerned. And fast forward to two weeks ago when you spoke to him, it sounded just from listening to you that you were kind of free. You were carefree about him. You felt like he was in a good place. Did you feel that way? I did feel that way. He seemed better than I had seen in a while. He was emotionally in a good place. He looked good. He quit smoking. Do you know if he was sober at that point? Yes, he was sober. So he was sober, he'd stopped smoking, he was working out, he was at a different, in a different space. Yeah, he, he was. He learned things throughout this. And what he learned more than anything is that he wants to help other addicts. And it gave him purpose. One of his last interviews that I saw, he said, I, I mean, I love the Friends cast, but I don't want that to be the first reason that people remember me, David. He said, I want to be remembered for the person who helps others go down the same path where I am, kind of a path of healing. Yeah, I, I, uh, that doesn't surprise me um, that uh, as important as the show was and continues to be, I think that that absolutely became his his purpose his 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 reason for for being Marta um just lastly what did you lose the day Matthew Perry died I lost a friend in multiple ways and what's amazing is the outpouring from the fans who lost a friend of theirs too and I hope wherever he is, he feels it. Yeah, I mean, it, just to underscore, she talked about that he was so kind of clean at the end, on the other side of all the addiction. He was talking about it. So I think that's why they were so stunned mm -hmm. to hear of his passing. But I think they did still think that he would be surprised at the amount of love he was yeah, getting. Yeah. Sometimes you don't know. You know, you live your whole life and you wonder. And right. then all of a sudden, you see you like see this wave outpouring. coming. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's why they say the, the folks you love, give them their flowers now. Yeah. You know, yeah. They're yeah. still here to yeah. uh, great. enjoy it. Thank oh, you, guys. Thanks, thanks for, for having me at your table. Yeah, always good to have you. Always right. good Okay, we take a bit of a turn now. A big change in the forecast. Calendar says November 1st, but it's beginning to feel a lot like winter. NBC's Maggie Vespa live with more in a little chilly <laughs> Chicago. Maggie, what's the latest? You got your temperature, your little thermometer with you? <laughs> I do, I do. Actually, we bought a new thermometer going into the winter. We didn't want to you know, run the old one into the ground, so this is a brand new one. Looks exactly the same, though. You can see right around freezing this morning here in Chicago, about 32 degrees. That makes sense because the snow is starting to melt. But still, I mean, November 1st, this is insane, right? Let me show you the video from yesterday. We'll start with the Chicago snow that you saw in the piece earlier in the show. Actually caught me off guard coming out of our NBC tower uh, in the middle of downtown. It just started 
hammering uh, the city with snow, and that's kind of what piled up here. Elsewhere in the Midwest, the winter weather, as you saw, did cause some problems. Just south of Chicago, we had an 18-car pileup on a highway. No injuries reported at this time, but we're keeping an eye on that. Elsewhere, Rochester, Michigan, we saw a driver go off the road. Cleveland, we saw drivers slowing down on the highway. So that ice, that snow catching people off guard, especially because, get, again, it's the first snowfall of the season. We still have more than a month to go in fall. And then, guys, obviously the big headline. I mean, the stakes were so high going into Halloween. We had so many families out and about here in the Chicago area. We saw video from our Midwest affiliates. Everybody was braving the conditions, but we had a lot of last minute tailoring to those carefully curated costumes. We talked about this yesterday. It's so heartbreaking to cover up a costume with a coat, but everybody did such an incredible job. I mean, look at that video. We even saw that one kid dress as a taco. He kind of wrapped up like a burrito at the last minute. So it seems like it worked out long term. So back here in the Midwest, we do have the thaw underway. Warmer temperatures settling in um, sort of as we speak for the rest of the week. And guys, you know, as far as Halloween goes, I mean, the candy tastes just as good, like once you physically thaw out as well. So hopefully all's well that ends well, but it just feels like a preview of what's to come. And I, for one, frankly, am not ready. Oh, oh, well, <laughs> you're we ready now, good. Maggie. You look yes. good. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Maggie. All the Thank pieces Maggie. are coming together. Yeah. Uh, well, the temperatures certainly give away that the holidays are kind of right around the corner. But if you need another reminder, here you go. Mariah Carey stepped into her role as Queen of Christmas to let us all know. Take a look. Song is back. You, I was just about to say. I just like. I love it. You may roll your eyes at first, but then next no. thing you know, you're swaying. Yeah, you you do. So. You do. And you're singing. I bet you're hitting those notes. It'd be nice <laughs> if we could have a Thanksgiving song. I mean, yeah. Yeah. there might be one. It'd be nice. Like, like, a, like a bridge. Gobble, song. gobble. I don't know. Yeah. Something. It's something. all of this silly. So you want do like, the gobble, yes. gobble, wobble, wobble. So, someone should That's create. That's actually already a dance. From the yeah, final, why didn't I think of that? Yes. You come up with it. Um, yeah. I'm going to get right on it. Mariah Carey is actually heading out onto her holiday tour. Oh. It's called Merry Christmas, One and All. Do you know it is estimated each holiday season Conservatively, she makes about three to five million dollars. I can believe the rights to just song. off of the rights. Yeah, to because it? she wrote it. That's so and she, that and that's precisely why she is promoting yes. Christmas the day after the Halloween. Day after Halloween. There you go. Well, 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 just go to sleep. Just the money just right. comes. Uh, <laughs> when Mariah says it's time, I guess that means it's time. So okay. uh, we do already know where this year's Rockefeller Center Christmas tree Ooh. is coming from. Once again. It's a Norway spruce. There's a look at Ooh, her. That looks perfect. She comes from the Binghamton area. Binghamton. 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 Okay. Uh, she's going to arri arrive outside our window Ooh. next Saturday. Uh, then the decorating starts. So mark your calendars. Christmas in Rockefeller Center, Wednesday, November 29th, only on NBC. We're we just know. cruising right. right into right, the right, Dylan. She looks perfect already. You know, sometimes she needs they yeah. you know, some extension structure. <laughs> oh, I mean, I think when they bring her in. They'll, she's they'll, still going to need yeah. some extension. Yes. Just, just, just a little just more a little... adornment. Yes. Okay. <laughs> That's all. And this morning, we have another sure sign of the season unveiling this year's Starbucks oh, holiday oh. menu and their holiday designer you, cup designs. Mm -hmm. We have a sampling here. Uh, Gerard, our favorite elf, uh, <laughs> bring back some old favorites. Peppermint mocha, mm. uh, uh, caramel brulee oh, latte, chestnut oh, praline chestnut. latte, yeah, and sugar cookie almond milk latte. Caramel brulee. What's this called? Okay. And then, okay, this is the iced gingerbread oh, I'll do that one. oat milk no, chai. Oat milk this is the new one. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, this what, which one do you want? Uh, well, I'll, I'll just try the iced okay. thing. Uh, all yeah. of these are going to be available in your uh, at your Starbucks tomorrow. Can I say something? Go right. You ahead. know I love chai tea lattes. Mm -hmm. Oh, it does taste like a this chai tea. This one is that's pretty good. Really good. That's pretty good. What, what For those of you who don't, this is it's this rich. Is the oatmeal delicious. chai. I mean, lattes. it is like dessert. It's got cinnamon, <laughs> gingerbread. It's a gingerbread. Yeah. This is pretty good. Yeah, I would put this up to replace pumpkin spice. Oh, me too. You would put anything up <laughs> yeah. to replace pumpkin that's spice. That's right. I'd put Limburger cheese up to. <laughs> <laughs> what? Hey, that was really anyway. smelly anyway. Coming up in today's checklist, we're talking men's health and the important numbers all guys and the people who care about their guys. 
advice you need to know. Then later, 10-time <laughs> Grammy winner, Shaka Khan, Shaka hey. Khan. She is here live in Studio 1A. We're going to look back at her hits, talk about her latest honor at the Rock and Roll Hall there of Fame, and more. Oh, oh Shaka hey. Khan. She's, she's just kind of poking in there. There she is. Hey. Oh, Shaka Khan, Shaka Khan. <laughs> Third hour of the day, right back. Shaka, Shaka. Woo! This morning on today's checklist, we're going to focus on men's health. November is also known by many as Movember, where guys take a closer look at their health and wellness. So here to break down the key numbers every man needs to know is board-certified surgeon and men's health advocate, Dr. Cedric McFadden. Doc, good to see you again. Good morning. Good to see you. Good to see you. All right, so let's start off with numbers that you should go over with your doctor. First up, 120 over 80. Yeah, so most people know this number, right? This is the blood pressure range, and this is characterizing sort of a normal blood pressure. Now, blood pressures can range. They can vary based on person to person. They can vary based on age, and also it can vary based on gender. Mm -hmm. Men are more likely to be diagnosed and found to have high blood pressure. If this number is high, there's some definite things that you can do that can help lower that number. And one of which is reduce the sodium or the salt intake. Mm -hmm. Now, that may be a little bit challenging because salt's in everything. Sure. It's in our seasonings, it's in our sauces, it's in canned vegetables. Here's a little trick. If you are using canned vegetables, take a time to pour the liquid out, mm -hmm. rinse the vegetables. Oh. You can reduce the salt, con salt content by nearly 40 to 50%. Really? What Just about alcohol? Alcohol, reducing alcohol as well, as well as uh, making sure you're having good exercise. In. If you don't, if that doesn't bring your number down, then what? Well, this is a conversation you need to be having with your doctor. And it's not just one reading that's going to diagnose you with hypertension. It's the trend. And if it's not responding to diet, exercise, you may need some medication. Let's yeah. talk about the magic number of 55. Yes. What do men need to know at that number? So this is the age that most men are going to start screening for prostate cancer. Uh, prostate cancer, depending on the risk, uh, that age may vary. So if you uh, have a family history of prostate cancer or you're African American, you may begin screening probably in the mid 40s. Now, this is a protein that's produced normally by the prostate. And when elevated, it can indicate prostate cancer, but it doesn't have to be prostate cancer. There are normal things that can cause an elevated PSA, such as inflammation in the prostate or BPH. As you get older, that number changes. And so mm -hmm. you may want to talk with your doctor about what does my number mean and does it make sense for me with my age? And are there, are there uh, groups that are more prone to this that have to worry about this a little bit more? Yeah, so that's the group that's going to start screening sooner. That's African-American men. That's also people who have a family history of prostate cancer. Okay, thanks, yes. Doc. Thank you. All right. Dr. McFadden, yep. let's talk about that. Apparently, this is a number we can track ourselves. We're talking yes. about yes. 150. What's the significance of that number? So this is the number of minutes per week that you need to be getting moderate to intense exercise okay. per week. And, you know, men, uh, you know, one out of three men in the U.S. are overweight. And this can really help reduce that. It seems like a lot. But if you break it apart, that's about 30 minutes, five days a week. Now, this is moderate intent. So this is activity that when you're doing it, mm -hmm. you're doing it so much that you can talk, but maybe you can't sing. Right? So this is... He can't you know, sing anyway. Yes. Yes. Wow. But, but he can dance. Basically. Oh, yes, right. And even that intense <laughs> dancing can increase your heart rate. So that's the thing you can do. They also recommend, CC recommends that you get some muscle strengthening exercises at least two days a week and walking. Al's a great proponent of that. We used to say 10,000 steps per day. The recent publication by the European Journal of Preventive Cardiology, they've actually brought it down to at least 4,000 steps mm. per day oh. that can reduce mm. the rate of uh, death or right. reduce the risk of death for any cause, including heart disease. 
The next number is a range, four to five. What does yes. that mean? So four to five servings of fruit, vegetables a day. Okay. All right. So we have to be very intentional about this. Men don't eat vegetables compared That's to women, true. right? So you have to be intentional about getting a daily serving. Now, How big is a serving? So we're talking an apple. We're talking half a cup of vegetables, all right? Mm. So if you can plan ahead, take an apple in the car, make it a part of what you use as you drive throughout the day. That's great. That's good. And then we put we put some suggestions on the screen there. Absolutely. Dr. McFadden, thanks as always. Thank you. Thank so much. you. And I appreciate Very that. Helpful. Appreciate your kind words about the dancing as well. <laughs> Very quick. True or not. Uh, coming up, a living music legend, Shaka, Shaka Khan, is here live in Studio 1A. We cannot wait to talk about her incredible career and legacy. And she's about to be a Hall of Famer, too. And then later this morning, another icon this morning, LeVar Burton, was joining us today. He will share... Uh, his newest project that reaches out to kids in a whole new way. We'll be right back. The City Music Series on today is proudly presented to you by City. Uh, this morning we are catching up with music royalty. Shaka Khan is a 10-time Grammy Award winner who burst onto the scene in the 1970s as the front woman for the funk band Rufus. And after churning out classics like Tell Me Something Good and Sweet Thing, Shaka went on to sing solo hits like I'm Every Woman and I Feel For You. And Shaka is celebrating a milestone 50th year in the industry. And this weekend, she will receive a huge honor. On Friday, she is being inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Shaka Khan, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So how does it feel? You're, you're going to be receiving the Musical Excellence Award. What does that feel like? It, it, it feels great. I mean, um, you know, I've gotten lots of accolades throughout the years and received lots of flowers. Um, this is one of those special bouquets because I think what it does is um, I think we're focusing a little more uh, with this uh, award on the fact that I'm a multi-genre, mm -hmm. uh, you, know, you know, artist and that, you know, rock and roll is like my... <laughs> This is really Happy place. the first yeah. album I ever bought was a uh, rock and roll album. And, and you're going to be there's going to be all sorts of memorabilia, costumes, things like that. Yeah. Uh, what what will people glean from that about you mm. when they when they well look? they have a great archive there and um, uh, it's amazing. I was really blown away um, uh, to see the archives because it's just some some of the some things that Jimi Hendrix had worn and mm. you know James Brown and whoever. Yeah. But uh, also, I'm, a, I'm an artist, so some of my artwork is in there. Oh, wow. And um, so it's, 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 an, it's, it's a really well done, you know, institution. Yeah. You, grew, you grew up in Chicago. We were talking about this a little bit earlier. What kind of music did you love as a kid? You talked about rock and, you know, what, what kind of music did you grow up listening to? Well, I grew up with two parents who um, were the saying and loved music mm -hmm. and um so we had a very rich history coming up my sister and i and uh i grew up really listening to a lot of jazz and wow. um you know uh, sarah ella mm -hmm. billy and my dad was like into max roach and um miles davis mm -hmm. and Bob. It's, an, it's an interesting it's interesting his dad once once i 
got into the business, um, I got to work with a lot of these artists. Oh. Um, and my that my dad turned me on to in jazz. Yes. So we, we were all kinds of music, from Yima Sumac to Mario Lanto. And speaking wow. of getting into the business, you got your foot in the door in, with the band Rufus. Yeah. But you weren't the original lead singer. That's true. But you sure, certainly learned a lot from her. <laughs> yeah, I did. <laughs> Paulette McWilliams, um, who is still a great friend and like a big sister to me, um, she taught me the ropes, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, um, and really was like a protective force mm-hmm. because I started at like 17. Wow. I had no business yeah. <laughs> in clubs. She taught you to wear eyelashes yes, and all the I fun stuff. Lashes, <laughs> you know, the whole night. But, you know, yeah, she's still in my life today. That's great. Yeah. Those uh, those earrings are, are, are beautiful. It's so beautiful. In fact, they're hitting the microphone just That's a little. That's what I thought. I yes. was telling I it's told so the sound funny. guy earlier. Oh, there you go. Is that better if I throw it back? Is that better? But in addition to those <laughs> those beautiful earrings, you've got a, a line of perfume yes, that's out now. That's Tell good. us about this perfume that's that that you're big on and it also delightful. Thank transcendental you. meditation as well. Well, but, well, now nah, you're mixing two things together. I know, I know. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I'm into transcendental meditation. It's true. But this perfume is um can take you there, <laughs> I oh. guess, you know, can assist. Smell is really important, you were mm-hmm. talking about. Oh. Um, you know, I, I think that it, it's very instrumental in like the uh, the mate that mm-hmm. one picks. Mm-hmm. These are things that you don't think about that are not conscious. Yeah. But I think that they are very, they're very important. Mm-hmm. Um, um, and with my fragrance, uh, the fragrance itself, I just fragrances that I've used throughout the years mm-hmm. in oils that I've worn you know, since the 70s and mm-hmm. stuff like that. And uh, just all my favorite fragrances that that affect me in some profound way. Mm-hmm. And I put them together in a nice way. Yeah. Well, and the packaging um, could make any, I mean, once you wear this perfume, um, you're gonna feel like a rock star. Yeah. All <laughs> right, there you go. Once you once you hold the bottle, yeah, you're gonna really feel like a rock star. I can't oh, wait. Special. Well, Shaka, yeah. it is packaging. so great to see you. Like, and congratulations on the upcoming honor this weekend. Thank you so, so much. Well deserved. Thank you. Yes. Well deserved. Thank you. All right. Maybe even long overdue. <laughs> uh, when we come back from one icon to another actor and host, LeVar Burton, live hey. to share his newest project, It's a Mystery That You Need to Hear. There's hey. your clue. And then later, Diary of a Wimpy Kid author. Jeff Kinney's here. He's going to, there's Jeff right hey. there. All right. Uh, he's going to share his book picks, including one that was just turned into a movie with some major A-listers. Third hour of today, right back after this. Our next guest is an award-winning actor, director, but above all, a great storyteller. Mm. Yes, yes. LeVar Burton's breakthrough role, of course, came mm. back in 1977 in that groundbreaking miniseries, Roots. He went on to win 12 Emmys and a Peabody Award for the PBS show, Reading Rainbow. And now LeVar is educating and entertaining kids in a whole new way in the podcast, look at this, Sound Detectives. He plays a mysterious inventor named LeVar Burton, <laughs> helping figure out why sounds are disappearing all over the world. 
Intriguing. LeVar, good morning to you. Good morning, y'all. It's good to see you this morning. Okay, so before we we get into this podcast, Mm -hmm. we want to do six degrees of separation here in the studio. Mm. Shaka Khan, you have a unique connection Mm. with Shaka. Shaka and I have been friends for a long time. When we redid the Reading Rainbow theme song back in the 80s, Shaka wrote the track, she plays drums, and and does the lead vocal. There it is. Yes, butterfly in the sky. I can go twice. So, so there's <laughs> there's there's the Tina Fabrique version and there's the Shaka Khan oh, version amazing. of the Reading Rainbow theme that. song. I love we that. know which one we like best. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. Uh, that was great. You, that was Shaka. great. Wow. So this, let's talk about this podcast. It's so much fun. Um, it's like an old time mystery for kids. Where did the idea come from? You know, this idea came in from um, from the producer of my podcast, Julia Smith. If okay. you've ever listened to Lavar Burton reads, you've heard me mention her. I say that Julia is the best in the business, and she is. So she and her producing partner, Joanna Sokolowski, brought this idea into LeVar Burton Entertainment. Um, I've been in the podcast business for a minute now. My, my podcast, LeVar Burton Reads, is in its 12th season my goodness. now. My goodness. Um, and I'm really excited about returning to children's programming in a new media that, that I love. Absolutely, yeah. And you're such an advocate for reading. I read with my kids every night, but I realize because they can't read yet, they're listening. Yes. What is so important about listening? What we try to do in this podcast is alert the, the, the listener, the child, or the adult or, or, or family member that's in the audience with them to the, the importance of the world of sound and to get them to, to exercise their imagination mm. through this exercise of trying to figure out what that sound from the world mm. is. Um, I think that our imaginations as human beings, it's our superpower. Mm. And the more we can encourage kids to live in that aspect of, of, of themselves, the imaginative self, mm-hmm. um, the, the, the better our kids are going to grow up. Mm. Yes. And, and Reading Rainbow, this is hard to believe, just celebrated its 40th yeah. anniversary. Yeah. And then, of course, you know, you talk about, as we just showed, your groundbreaking role mm-hmm. in Roots. Uh, when you reflect on what you've done mm. in, in so many sides of media, Mm -hmm. you know, what do you want people to come away with? I don't know. Um, I feel like as as an actor, as a storyteller, I've been able to really represent the black experience from slavery to the future, to the stars. Right. Um, And in in Star Trek and LeVar, the reading rainbow guy is in the middle of that continuum. Right. It goes from from Kunta to LeVar through to George. It's amazing. I've never really thought about that way, but you're right. I and your daughter. Apparently, you couldn't keep her from from catching the bug. Mika Burton is is uh, has become an actor, um, yeah. and I, I had an opportunity to work with her in the third season of, of Star Trek: Picard. She plays one of Jordy LaForge's two daughters. That's so, um, I, I don't think it gets any prouder for a papa yeah. you know, yeah. um, than that. And I know you 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 gentlemen know what I'm talking about. Yeah, that's amazing. Did you that's want amazing. her to get into? No, I, we did not. Her mother. And I, <laughs> Absolutely not. No, her mother and I. Um, um, we're very, very clear that showbiz is not for kids. Um, <laughs> and so she left home uh, to go to college as as an English major and then wow. auditioned uh, to get into the School of, of Music, Theater and Dance at the University of Michigan um, in her first semester, won a spot in the program and then called us and told us she had changed. Oh, after. <laughs> after. After. Oh, after. wow. Which we were thrilled about because yeah. she claimed it as an adult, yes. right? Mm-hmm. She right. claimed it on her own. Yeah. That's, That's right. Lavar, uh, thank you for coming. You are just, a sp- you're just, a we're spirit. speechless. Just a great spirit. <laughs> for us, you mean, Which for Chanel is I, really I, You mean so much to us and so many people watching. I mean, from like, from Roots to Reading Rainbow, like the work that you have done has just been, it just transcends just yeah. plain old acting. And, yes. yes. You know what I mean? Like you are just an icon living. So thank you. Any guy who can make people in. feel with that thing on his face during Star Trek. <laughs> That's acting. I mean, all That's of it. Acting. All of it. That's acting. So you can listen to this latest project, Sound Detectives, yes. on the SiriusXM app, Apple Podcasts, and wherever Premier podcasts today. are available. November 1st. November oh, 1st. Today. Today. Congratulations. Today. So it's it's yes. fitting, again, we were playing Six Degrees a second ago, fitting that LaVar is here, because <laughs> up next, we're talking about reading. Yes. Yes. Superstar author, Jeff Kinney, the man behind those wildly yes. popular Diary of a Wimpy Kid books that I've, I've purchased at least 14 of them myself. <laughs> I, he is here to share his fall book picks and his latest book as well. Third hour of today, right back after this. I love it.
is the perfect time to cozy up with a good book. And we have an expert here to share the best new reads on the market. Jeff Kinney is the author of the internationally acclaimed series Diary of a Wimpy Kid. He sold more than 290 million copies worldwide. And now Jeff is out with the 18th book in this series. It's called No Brainer. <laughs> Jeff, good morning. Good morning. Hey, Jeff. I got to meet you about a year ago this time up at your bookstore in Unlikely Story up in Massachusetts. That's your right. your whole office is decked out with Diary of a Wimpy Kid, everything. And now here you are with the 18th book. Wow. Yeah. What, what's this one about? Oh, this one's all about the, it's the satire of the American school system. It covers everything <laughs> from budget cuts to book bans. Mm -hmm. And um, Greg's school is going to be closed for underperformance. So he needs to save the school by becoming principal for the day. Wait, that's amazing. Nice. Yeah, and I actually have a surprise for you here today. Okay. I've drawn each one of you in my cartooning style. Oh, wow. What? <laughs> it took me a little bit of time. Oh, but, really? um, but there is a catch. Um, so Greg Heffley, no, nothing ever goes right for my main character, Greg Heffley. Mm -hmm. So I've taken a little bit of your personality and had things go wrong for you. So can we Wait. get up the image of, of Al? Of course, I had to go with the weather-related uh, <laughs> picture are? here. So, oh, yeah, that's, that's oh, that is so oh my awesome. gosh. You're getting swept away <laughs> on a rainy, windy day. And of course, you forecast sunny skies. <laughs> that that's your that's about par for the course. Uh, Chanel, we have a picture for you. I understand you're running the boss, uh, not the, the Boston York, Marathon, yeah. the New York Marathon. Yes. But of course, the city streets oh, are all over. <laughs> to have this oh, picture. Wow. So that watch so where you cool. step because that's there's a, tons of chewing wait, gum. Wait, that's around. amazing. Oh, that's not so chewing cool. gum. And then Craig, I understand you have a bit of a green thumb. So I I've captured does. a moment of you with a bad moment. Oh, that's <laughs> hilarious. I don't know if I captured your likeness, but I captured the emotion. Oh, that's right? it. You it. captured both. Yeah, you got it. You got it. Well played. And then Dylan, we've all been following your lost luggage and reunion. Oh, oh, it's oh, back. Oh, it's back. Oh, that's Make hilarious. Sure you close your bags. You that's oh my God, that's really funny. Oh, that's Jeff, Jeff that's amazing. awesome. That's fantastic. So there you are in the wimpy world. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, for, you the for that. By the way, your your newest book just showed up at my house two days ago. So yeah. We've funny. got the entire collection. My, my son Delano loves your work. Oh. He's going to be really flabbergasted when I show him that. That's awesome. What I really love about this new book, you're not going on a traditional book tour either. You're actually, Jeff being Jeff, you're going to use it to do some good. Yeah. Game shows to raise money for, for libraries. That's right. We're giving away $100,000 to school and community libraries so kids can compete, librarians can compete oh, wow. for these prizes. And we're also giving away a thousand uh, diverse high interest books to that reflect the nation that we live in uh, to libraries all along our tour route. That's amazing. Oh, that's, that's fantastic. It's like a, seriously. I'm awesome. All right. So we're going to get into your, your book recommendations. First one's been made into a movie. Uh, this is obviously for adults. <laughs> that's <laughs> yeah. right. Yeah. Killers of the Flower Moon. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Killers oh. of the Flower Moon by David Grant. Uh, this book's really fascinating. Of course, it's out now in theaters, but it's it's about the investigations of the Osage, uh, Osage uh, oh, murders, yeah. I'm yeah. sorry, um, uh, where they have oil on their land. And it's a really gripping nonfiction book okay. that reads like a thriller. Wow, mm. wow. All right, next up you have a funny read for us that involves a supervillain business. That's right, it's called Starter Villain by John Scalzi. <laughs> okay. It's about a kid who inherits his uncle's supervillain enterprise, uh, complete with <laughs> a, a volcano lair and dolphin sentries. Okay. And it, he finds out that all the other supervillains are trying to kill him. Oh, oh wow. Okay. Yeah. Could be a movie but too. it's funny. That does sound like a movie. Okay, there's a lot of celebrity memoirs coming out recently, um, and you say you have to check this oh, one out. Oh, yes. love him. But this is the best of yeah. the best. It's oh. called Being Henry, The Fonz and Beyond by mm. Henry Winkler. And it's about his struggles with dyslexia and coming back down to earth after mega stardom. And um, he came to my bookstore as well, and it's confirmed he's the nicest guy in Hollywood. He really yeah. is. Yeah. He's been on our radio show. He's been yeah, here several times. Him. He's amazing. You, um, you, of course, one of the most famous of, of children's book writers. This next one is one that we could read with our, our young ones. That's right. It's called The Lost Library by Rebecca Stead and Wendy Mass. And it's about a mysterious library that suddenly appears in a small town. An 11-year-old girl who gets two books that uh, that change her life, mm. 
and it's a celebration of the power of a good story and librarians. Wow. I'll take, I'll take that one. I know, yeah. Grab it too quick. Right, well, <laughs> next, <laughs> next time you'll be a little faster. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. I was waiting. Jeff, what Thank an honor. So much. Thank it's you so, so nice much to have you here. Yes. And to see Jeff's picks, head to today.com slash books. And of course, No Brainer is out now. I love that. You're a rock star in all of our homes. Thank you, Jeff. All right, coming up, our series, This Is Today. The story is getting a lot of buzz on today.com, including which celebrities brought it for Halloween this year. We'll be right back. We're back with another edition of one of our favorites. This is called This Is Today. This is where we highlight the most popular stories on today.com. And this morning, we're taking a look at some buzzworthy topics from October. If you want to weigh in, all you have to do is scan that QR code on the screen. Today, digital editorial director, Ariana Davis is here with us. Good, 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 Good to see you. Happy November 1st. Happy Yay. November 1st. <laughs> Just obviously coming off Halloween, a lot of celebrities they went all out. All out, including y'all, but we'll get to that in a second. <laughs> but last night was was Halloween, and there were so many great costumes. We saw Heidi Klum, of course. She oh, goes gosh. she goes in every single year with her big over-the-top Halloween party. And last night, oh, she wow. was a peacock with her dancers peacock. as like her peacock's tail. It was really, oh it was really beautiful. And she just always just goes head to toe, like with that makeup and the prosthetics. Oh, it was, wow. it was something else. Was Cirque du Soleil. Wow. Dancers. Yes. Yeah. Cirque du Soleil dancers. It was really intense. There were some other really great ones this year. The Kardashians always make news for theirs. Uh, this year, Kim and North were um, Dion and Cher from Clueless. It was a really cute costume, like a mother daughter costume oh, together. That was cute. Yeah, it was a really cute pairing. And then, uh, we also saw Kiki Palmer as the Bride of Frankenstein. Oh. She was also really cute with her son. So there was a lot of really great costumes this year with people oh, just like getting that. very creative. But I have to say, I think my favorite Halloween 2023 costume was MC Hammer. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Craig, I think Craig, I, the he, best the today.com was really loving the dance moves, I have to say. This oh, is, yeah. This was a, but everyone, I think all of you guys, all of our readers on today.com were super Woo. into the costume. Oh, you killed it with that little oh, spin. Yeah. The little oh, spin. I like yep. giving you a couple points. Then there was, the, there was the dancing on the ceiling for Mr. Roker that our readers were also loving. Diana Ross with the flowing hair. And oh, then yeah. we got to give it to you for the yes. pink. The, the pink, ta the leg tattoo and everything, you really owned it. So. I still have the leg tattoo. I, I would keep our, washing off. Or is that, is that permanent? Off. We were wondering. Our costume and makeup and wardrobe departments, I mean, they are. They're Wait next makers. level. So we just go out there and we try not to embarrass them. Yes. <laughs> we're, we're, we're performing oh. for them. Yes, we are. Several people on Today.com's team said that they would pay money to see Chanel live. Just saying. Oh, wow. So just amazing. letting you know, we, <laughs> right. we, were, we were very into it. We'll call it Chanel friends. We get Janet, Diana. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Shaka. We just keep changing costumes. We love that. So next article is about Day of the dead uh it's an annual uh, holiday that celebrates our ancestors yes so day of the dead also known as dia de los muertos is uh, an annual holiday it kicks off today and it's until tomorrow and it started in the mexican community but has really expanded to latin america around the world and basically it's a way of celebrating our lost loved ones you can have altars or ofrendas as they're called and basically you offer them you know food their favorite things water candles it's like a beautiful way to celebrate lost loved ones and you can learn more about the holiday on today.com all right, all right. it's officially yeah. soup season time for a costco favorite yeah 
Yes, a Costco favorite that's causing a little bit of buzz online. So there is a $3.49 by the pound uh, Chili's Chili at Costco that's oh. available. That's like a fan favorite. People love this chili every George. season. Oh, we have it. Wow. It's one of the sides that you can grab. But it stirred up a little bit of questions online about how you like your chili. People are basically wondering if you're pro having beans in your chili or if you're like a no beans in your chili kind of person. If there are no beans, beans in the chili, it's not chili. No, there are a lot of people who do without Some beans. Some people say yeah. that basically yeah. if you have, it's like bean soup. I'm not really a big fan of beans and chili, I, I have like to say. I like some beans. Let's not I go do. crazy with the beans, but I also like toppings, like the yeah. cheese, cheese and the scallions. The onions, and scallions, scallions yeah. a little bit of also, everything. I like chunk beef, not ground beef in my chili. Oh, oh. wait, does this come In other words, like, you cut up, you cut up stew style. beef, and yeah. So really? it's in the side yeah. section at Costco, and it's only three forty nine by the pound, and apparently people love this it, and they wait for it every season delicious. to come back. Delicious. Yeah. This is from Costco? It's really yeah, good. from Costco. We say yes. Oh. Um, all right. Okay, the last topic, the United Airlines boarding Wilma. thing. Yes, is that, Wilma. Is that working? What's yes. going so on Yes, so as this? of October 28th, United Airlines is now boarding by window seat first, then middle seat, and then aisle seat. They say this will save two minutes in the boarding process for every flight in an effort to kind of speed up the boarding process. But of course, people have thoughts. Some people yeah. like this mm -hmm. system. Other people are worried, hey, if I have an aisle seat, which is myself, then yeah. does that mean if I go on last, I won't have overhead space yeah, for my right. suitcase? Exactly. What is this going to mean? Well, if you're so traveling with someone, yeah. you exactly. board with them. And okay. they say they've, they've reconfigured the overhead oh, they're space. Going they're, they're going, they're to, going to, yes. I, that doesn't mean they, they will do it in time for this. Yeah. Well, my exactly. biggest issue was, I mean, two minutes. Does it really say <laughs> you're saving that much time? Right. If it's 20 minutes, okay, sign me up. I love yeah. how we've turned you into their marketing. We're like, well, we yeah. don't understand. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Clearly, we have I'm opinions on that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank this you, Ariel. This was great. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Especially yeah. thanks for bringing chili. Yeah, uh, yeah. I do what I can. <laughs> for more on these stories, you know where to go. It's today.com. And to sign up for our really cool This Is Today newsletter, just scan that QR code that's on your screen right now. You'll get the latest news to your email every morning. Third hour today, right back. You can tell it's good because we're still eating. I know. Yeah. This is yummy. everybody here's what's happening in your neck of the woods oh, you deserve to be celebrated way to go reynolds oh al, al you're all of our heroes y'all yeah. love al roker tomorrow on the third hour of today we are helping you become the ultimate holiday party host yeah then you can invite us all over we'll be there <laughs> coming up on hoda and jenna music superstar usher oh we're gonna see you back here How's tomorrow this chili's just like the day we hope you have. Great. Oh, I didn't know where he was going one. with that. I did, did I? <laughs> stars in the world usher is here plus the perfect wine and food pairings for your fall get-togethers and it's november 1st which means it's time watch mariah carey's spectacular christmas announcement from studio 1a in rockefeller plaza it's today with hoda and jenna 
It all starts right now. Hey, everybody. It is the first day of November. November's here. We're in a new month, and I didn't even know it. Brand new, fresh month. I like that. I, I like ate a fresh so much start. candy, I forgot. But here we go. We have such a show to start our month off. Oh, we I mean, sure when do. you start off in November, it should be the way we're starting ours off today. We've got music superstar Usher. It's his very first live in person interview since he announced that he is headlining the Super Bowl halftime show. And what, like, a universally celebrated Loved. selection. For the Super Bowl, right? Loved. And, yeah. we, and we don't even know what he can perform because he has so many hits. I wonder what he's going to do. I think he'll do, yeah, oh, yeah. He's got to. Right? <clears throat> have to. He has to. Should we ask him? We'll, we'll ask him at least to give us a couple of songs. Of, like, possibilities, and then maybe the internet can vote on it. Like, I think there should be on one it. that the, everyone votes on. Okay, let's talk to him okay, about it. Right. We're going to try to help figure out what's happening. We can't wait. Uh -huh. um, and, uh, and you know what? Videos have been going viral because he has that residency in Vegas. Oh, my God. Is that Jessica Alba? Yes, it is. Oh, I didn't know he serenaded Jessica. Oh, yes. There he Kiki, is. We remember we, that. We sure do. Um, he's serenaded all of these women. Oh, my gosh. At he has his a way. residency. He's got a way about him. He sure does. It's like. Do you get kind of blushy when you see that things like that? I think, I think there's something, cr just crazy intimate about being serenaded. Someone singing in yes. your eyes with others. Even there. if there are others there or not, sometimes the others just melt away because you're like, is this moment happening right here, right now? Ooh. Someone is singing to me from their soul. You've and had it's that happening. Well, if, if you know when you have a connect and you're like, I feel this moment, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's very cool. So anyway, we can't wait. We cannot wait. We love that. Well, happy Halloween day after. How was yours? Did you the... love being Cher? <coughs> I did. Did you love being Sunny? You it did. Was fun to be, it's fun to be a man just every once in a while, you know? I, you know what? I think you have more fun. <laughs> Are you having so much fun Look at with you hair? with your oh, leisure so suit. Whoa. These These are small. Oh. <laughs> I, I like I like your share impersonation. Oh. Yeah. I was doing that at home with Hope. I go, come on, Hope. 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 <laughs> Did she, she was, like it? She didn't know what I was doing. Who's that? I go, it's important. But I do think there is, I loved our show yesterday, I have to say. Yes. I loved our variety show. Me I love what our producers did. They were amazing. I thought it was super, super, super. So fun. how was trick or treating? What time did you go? Okay, the funny thing is we went at a little bit before four. Yes. And we got dressed up. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Haley was Glinda or Princess Peach, and Hope was a butterfly. And there's Joel. We went out. We dressed as, as rainbows. Cute. By the way, if you've ever gone trick, this is trick or treating in New, New York. Ready? Here they are. Hi. We're at the at the grocery, grocery store. <laughs> trick or treat. And by the way, you go into every hair salon. Oh yeah. Pinky nail salon. Oh yeah. The liquor store. Yes. Trick or treat. And when they leave, you we just walked up and down about four blocks. They were tapped out full. I mean, full on before we even got to our own apartment building. So it was about a 45 minute excursion. That's it. How Perfect. about for you guys? Would you we, we went around 4 15, 4 30. This is. Oh, my. Oh, you did I the wore pizza. the pizza. May I thank okay. And how was a New York City rat, rat okay, uh, fireman? Rat. Okay. I was a pizza slash fire. Yeah. Because I couldn't walk around with the pizza. I kept hitting kids People. in the face and okay. others. So, so then I just took it off. And how about Mila and Poppy? And what? Mila was um, a bunny or yeah. something. Yeah. And Poppy was, <laughs> <laughs> you know, she's wearing those onesies. And then Poppy was an angel. Oh. And we had so much fun. Mila was by herself, though. I told you. She went out with her crew. Her crew? Her crew. Wait, I thought you were her crew. I Believe me, so did I. But when she returned home... It was, yeah. first of all, she oh. got home early. We got yeah. home at 7.15. Yeah. She got home at 8 because we let the kids eat a little dinner afterwards, yeah. uh -huh. which is, was a, a good thing to yeah. do, by the way. Yeah, smart. Trick or treat, get some then, sugar, then, then eat. eat. Don't, right, don't have dinner and then First. pig out. Okay, so go um, on. So she like? came home mm -hmm. and she cuddled in bed with Henry and I and, and watched the Texas Rangers in the mm -hmm. World Series, mm -hmm. which is so funny to try. Yeah. Thank you, Rainey. They won. <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, we didn't stay up for the whole game, but mm -hmm. they were winning 5-0 when I went to sleep. Mm -hmm. Anyway, she was cuddled between us, mm -hmm. and she was, like, telling us everything about her night, every detail. And it made me think, even though I missed her, not having her with us, yeah. that yeah. we made the right decision. Because it go. was, yeah. she came back and told us 
everything. Mm -hmm. And I can't remember who told us this advice, but listen to every word that your kids say without judgment. Right. Because without then diving in and making a comment, yeah. just let it be. My mom's favorite line to us is, and then, mm. and then, she always says that. Like you finish your thought and you go, oh, and that you remember yeah. the next thing. It's like a tell me more. Yeah, kind of exactly. Thing. Mm -hmm. I love and then. Yeah, and then. So anyway, I, we think we made the right call, but I, you, what do you think? No, I think you do too. I mean, you do, but I do think it is a weird time when you're, you're not sure whether to let your child go off with other friends yes. or be part of your you know, what Crew. you fantasize, your family unit, totally. like we want this. And I don't know, like sometimes I think, you know, kids obviously they need to stretch their legs and have freedom. The way our parents did it back in the day was, you're coming with us. Yeah. I'm sorry that your friends are doing that. I'm sorry if your friends are staying out later than you. I'm sorry if yeah. they're all sleeping That's over. not, you don't live. You're not doing that. Yeah. And I think for me, I, at least I kind of remember this. I'm sure I was disappointed a million times, but I think it also gave you a sense of like, I'd be kind of scared anyway, and now I can't. Yeah. My parents said I can't. Yes. So I, well, I think it gives you permission to say to want yes. To, if you don't, you're kind of nervous to say no. It gives you permission, permission to, to say, say no. no. So maybe there's a way you can. Yeah. Will you speak with your? I was thinking about speaking with my daughters when they get older, but like. If you really don't feel comfortable, yeah. you blame just it let on me. me. You just let me know, and we'll, always we'll, blame it on me. Yeah, but I do think it does make for tighter siblings when you kind of force your kids to do things. Yeah, even if they don't want to. Like we were kind of all forced well, to go I mean, and do things together. We also have such strict boundaries around bedtime, yeah. and they don't get to have like no. unlimited sleepovers. Yes, because. I'm tired. Yes. And I do want on a Friday night, like family movie night. Yes. Or when they're together, the three of them, they're like hanging out, doing things. Yes. And if somebody's already always away, you're not going to have that. It's like, and a lot of people do this too, and I get why. It's like you invite another kid on your family vacation. Yeah. Now, it seems cool. And I think I actually just remembered that I think I went on a family vacation yeah. with another family. Yeah. But it also is that thing about your, you know who your daughter's going to be hanging out with, her friend. Yes. So the other child or children are going to be doing their own thing. Yeah. So. No, it's interesting. Anyway. Okay. Um, all right, you guys. It's November 1st. Mm -hmm. You know what that means. What? It's Go, Christmas! Girl. Don't you think it's so strange? It happened last year, too. Halloween, Halloween is over. Bring in Mariah. Well, that's how you know it's official when right. Mariah's got something to say. Take a look. By the way, in, in the movie Love Actually, that's a great scene. That but song. also, she oh. created one song that has been a hit and a hit and forever. a hit. Forever, forever, forever. Is it Christmas time already? It's Christmas. Mariah. Um, we're going to do a Christmas song. I can't wait. This is going to be big. It's going gonna, it's gonna to chart. <laughs> it's going to chart. We feel good about it. We hope it's going to chart. Coming up, you guys, before he performs at the Super Bowl this year, he is stopping by our studio. Who is he? Oh, he is music. Yeah.
morning. Welcome to today. Every day. We are adding to the star power in our studio. The biggest names. Only on today. See, we're coming in this early, right? Everybody, it's today. It's today. Like I won the no, lottery. Good. How do you feel at this age, this stage? Liberated. We're just getting started, folks. Ain't no stop with us now. <laughs> the boys are back in town. Boys are back in town. It's a miracle. It's a miracle. This has been fantastic. Everything and everyone you're talking about. Only on today. We hit the jackpot this morning because we have eight-time Grammy winner Usher in the house. He's going to join us in a second. But first, a look at the moment he's having. Two and a half decades ago, at just 19 years old, Usher exploded onto the R&B scene with his sophomore album, My Way. I just want take it nice and Eight albums and 18 chart-topping songs later, the hits keep coming. Usher currently has a residency in Las Vegas. It was recently extended by demand. By the end of the Vegas run, he will have sold out 100 shows for nearly half a million screening fans, including Jessica Alba, Taraji P. Henson, Issa Rae, and of course, Kiki Palmer, making his residency the spot for a girls' night out especially when you get some of that special Usher treatment. Usher's ninth studio album, Coming Home, drops February 11th. Good, good, but we still good. The album's single, Good Good, just hit number one. And now Usher's stepping onto the biggest stage in the world. Listen. We're doing the Apple Music Halftop Show. The Super Bowl. But today, he's stopping by our studio for his first live in-person interview since the Super Bowl announcement. Usher's right here, right now. Right now! Please, Please welcome, welcome Usher! Usher. You okay? Oh. oh. Is this a serenading moment right now? Is it right now? Well, ladies, take a seat. Let's get. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, oh ready? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How are you? It's Look at us. We, were, we sat. We're like, we did what you we're said. Like, we're like, please do it. Come sit here. Come sit. Come sit. Hi. Oh, my gosh. Usher, you're having a moment. This is so fun. Yeah. Okay, you get the call to do the Super Bowl. And you've you've hit a lot of highs, but this one had to be the mountaintop. Yeah, I mean, of course, you know, this this is the stage that we all, you know, celebrated some of the most incredible legendary artists of all time. And now I'm granted that opportunity to be able to perform for the world. The world, you yeah. You know, it's a it's a it's a bucket list, you know. It actually and fifteen million people. people. Hi. No pressure. <laughs> you got it. it. Right? Do you feel <laughs> yeah. do you feel that pressure or not really? Um, you know, it comes with it. You know, th yeah. this is this is a a grand opportunity to celebrate life. My music is really a celebration of life. You mm -hmm. know, for every moment that I've had, rather it was um, me crying or me being emotional or celebrating, I wasn't celebrating or doing those things by myself. Somebody was on the other end, and those were the fans that actually make it possible. So to be able to you know, bring R&B mm -hmm. to this yes. main stage. It's, it's great. It's I can't really amazing. imagine. Everyone's probably like, Usher, play this song. Usher, play oh, yeah. that song. Usher, yeah. play this song. Like us. What? Yeah. Yeah. So you guys yeah. have your list. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> cool. yeah. Are you going to sing? The, the, <laughs> no. the, the greatest list that I've received is actually from my son, Naveed. Okay. He, like, he is my musical director. He's my, like, silent uh, fairy new, uh, music. MD. How old? How old is he? He's 15. Okay. 15? What does yeah. he think? What does he think? Yeah. Uh, we'll be 15. Um, he, 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 no, he's given me an entire curation of, uh, of how much time in addition ah. to the songs. He's like, you know, don't waste time on this. You know, this, it just, I have an entire breakdown. This, today he just sent me this. <laughs> and are you following it? Or some you of it. Some, some of, of it? it? Some of it, yeah, yeah. Well, can we, we, we think we should let people vote on one of your songs. Just how do you like feel this. about that? I like this poll. Maybe we should get a poll. Should going. we get a poll? Just, yeah, because I think the viewer should pick one of the songs. This or, is, don't you think that's kind yeah, of Or a moment. What? It can even be just a yeah. moment. Uh, maybe, maybe we let the fans pick 
like a, 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 a moment. A yes. moment. Okay. Like it could just even be a part the, of it. A part of a song. Are you going to serenade up there on the stage? I mean, you know, you never in, know? in the Dolby Live, it's a, lo a little bit more intimate <laughs> of a theater. The stadium might probably makes it a little bit harder to find one lucky lady. Uh -huh. But right now, I have two very, very amazing lucky ladies. What? Music, please. Can you tell that I'm blushing? Am By I still way, here? We kind of understand what goes on. We don't kind of understand. Totally. We get it. Oh my gosh. Okay. We don't serving. know where to go with you've, this interview. You've been ushered. We've been, we've ushered. been ushered and we're <laughs> never going to be the same. Never. Never. Okay. Ever. We want to come to Vegas. Okay. Come on. Can for the Super Bowl or for actually the residents. This will be the. Uh, uh, 100th show that I that I um. I when performed. is your when is that? It, December the second is the final 100th show. The final. So you have up until the, the second to get There's there. There's no way it'll be extended again. 100. That's it. That's it. You're putting the pin in it at 100. Well, I mean, there's always a future of what Vegas has to offer, and it's been an amazing time. You got to realize, right? We started during the pandemic, and since then, there's been this this amazing celebration, as I said, yeah. of life and music, and and really the crescendo of that. Mm -hmm. Is now going to the Super Bowl. Well, and when people getting back together. Yeah. Like I think yeah, that the community, you can feel it even yeah. from social media. Great. So Usher, when you're at the Super Bowl, mm -hmm. sometimes people bring out yes. guests. Mm -hmm. You know, they bring out someone unexpected. <laughs> mm -hmm. Are you plotting, planning, thinking about bringing someone out on the stage? I'm going to try this a little bit differently. Okay. Right. Who do you think I should have there? I, we, we we think with Bieber. Bieber. Okay. We're we're hearing we're that hearing rumbling numbers. that we kind we of heard we've that been rumbling. Well, by anybody the else? God, there's Kiki Palmer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> She's our girl. We love Kiki. <laughs> we love Kiki. She's hilarious. Would you ever have her? Well, we've done a video together. Yeah, we know. And we all also we went kind of viral. We went remember? viral together. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. what we all do. Yeah, that's what we do in Vegas, you know. Okay, we're gonna. We're think coming about to Vegas because it are. seems what happens in Vegas. Vegas. <laughs> or maybe we, or maybe there. we we take Wait. a poll. I'm thinking. I'm thinking it could be fun. Okay, take a poll. You guys, we're Who? gonna do two internet polls. Yeah, the first one is a, a song, song or a moment. P pick a part of a song or a moment, and the second is pick the person who you think should join Usher for a moment <laughs> on the stage. This is gonna be so epic. And this in the meantime, epic. you guys have to come to Las Vegas. Of come to Las Vegas and see the show. Okay, we will. You have more to talk about. We're I do. Yeah. A quick commercial break and we'll be back with you okay. right after this. Usher, thank Flowers. you. Flowers. with the incredibly talented Usher. He's got a huge halftime performance at this year's Super Bowl. Yeah, but he also plays an even bigger mm. role at home, and that's, of course, dad to four. 
Uh, how are your babies? Yes, and how was Halloween? <laughs> Halloween was great. I actually posted photos last night. Yeah. Oh, oh my oh, gosh. Oh, stop. Princess Peach there and Mario. Oh, oh my gosh. That's <laughs> so <laughs> cute. Yeah, and they're What's the going big boys. They're, they're the bigs. Oh. Yeah, so. so they know that you're a cool dad. They must know. Um, you know, I hope that I'm still cool <laughs> to my big boys. Uh, the babies, I'm actually cooler. Yeah. They rely on me a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> I got to pick them up. <laughs> How is the evolution to being a dad of, of teens? Oh, man. It's like a different thing. It's an everyday, uh, you know, journey yeah. in itself, you know, with, with, with kids who obviously are forming interest in life. And, you know, but what I do is I teach us to love each other. Uh, love, and we, we are a very close-knit uh, family mm -hmm. uh, in our soul circle. Is, is one that is considerate of, of each other Soul as much as we can. You know? Soul circle that. that's considerate of each other. I, I love, love that. that. Let's, every parent has hurdles, and you're here for another very important reason. Correct. One of your children is a type 1 diabetic. Yes. And that's something that you've been dealing with. Will you explain why you've come here today to talk about it? Yeah, well, uh, partnering with Sanofi mm -hmm. uh, to create a movement, hopefully, that each and every person watching right now will take the One Pledge by going to theonepledge.com and make the pledge to be tested for type 1 diabetes. Now, in my situation, which is what makes this relevant, rele relevant and relative, is that uh, my child was diagnosed at the age of six. Mm -hmm. And had I had this information, had I known, I probably you know, could have made other formed decisions of mm -hmm. how to not only treat and, uh, and, and start the journey. Mm -hmm. uh, if you are a diabetic parent, then you do understand that at times uh, it becomes harder. And what I'm hoping is that this pledge is something that we all can support. It actually is something that is good for us to know. Part of the journey of life with health and wellness mm -hmm. is you understanding what's going on with your body. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'd like for everybody out there to take that pledge. There's so many things that come up socially, rather it's the yeah. ALS challenge or whatever it mm -hmm. might be. This is a pledge to me. I'd like to start a movement uh, not only because it's significant to me, but I think it could be helpful to a lot of people yeah. to get ahead. So please go to theonepledge.com and take the pledge. Yeah. Okay. The one. Like yeah, I mean, it's something I don't even think people know they can do, which mm -hmm. is to be tested. So mm -hmm. I think, thank you for spreading awareness yeah. about this. Yeah. You, okay, tell us your, how your partner is, yeah. how your girlfriend is. <laughs> uh, in dealing with type 1, it's very, uh, it's, a, it's a collaborative thing. Yeah. It's, a, it's something that we all, we all get alarm, alerts on our phones. Yeah. Uh, because, uh, you know, and, and um, by the way, uh, speaking to your physician, if you are diagnosed, uh, with T1D, there's a myriad of things and ways to be able to make certain that blood glucose levels yes. are balanced and also to you either, are, you know, have a specific diet or either you administer insulin. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, type 1 diabetes is not something that you can prevent if you have it. Yeah. But you can detect it early enough to begin to, to be prepared it, manage it. in managing well, it. Well, I'm glad you're speaking out about that. Now, Usher, on another note, you have a new album that happens to be dropping perfect timing. Yeah. On, the, is day, it on Super, the day of the Super, Super Bowl, Bowl or day after? Coming home. Yeah. Coming, Coming home. home. Yeah. And Good Good has already gone, yeah. hit number one. Good Good is great. Good good is great. <laughs> you just know it. Good good is good good. Do you know what? Do you know when you when you have one that's going to hit? Well, I mean, you get the sense. And and working with the people whom I chose to work with on this album, it's part of what I mean when I say I'm coming home. Mm. You know, having started my career with L.A. Reid and now partnering with him, mm. in, uh in in our venture Mega, uh, begins to start and inform. You know, one this passion that we've had for music and this passion that we have for each other and covering each other and also to making certain that we go as far as we can and also to working with some of the producers that I've worked mm -hmm. with in the past, the creatives that I've worked with. So I'm really excited about not only the Super Bowl, but also to the next offering, which is Coming Home. Coming Stop. Home, we can't wait. Usher, we love you. Usher, We're so you happy. Usher, give can. us the three songs <laughs> that are possibilities that we can put on our oh, today yeah. poll. Oh, yeah. <laughs> give us just three yeah, yeah. choices. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, let me see. One. You got it bad. You yeah, got it bad. definitely. You got it. You got it. Uh, let me see. Uh, I gave you two. You guys give me one. Okay, should we to choose between those two? I think it's an easier. Play. No, 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 no. I want you to give me one more. You said three songs. Well, right? our I said, mine was mine. Yeah. 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 We've already chosen ours. So yeah, okay. So uh, let me see. Nice and slow my way. Okay. Could be okay. one. All right, that's it. We got our three. Yeah, got it. We got our three. <laughs> vote. And the collaborators who we're going to have on there. We are going to, should we select those two? Go for it. Bieber, Bieber, Kiki Palmer. Who would be a good third? 
Natalia? Beyonce. <laughs> Beyonce. <laughs> Alicia. Oh, Alicia. Keys. Give me more. Come Alicia. on. Alicia. Oh, Rihanna. 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 Okay. What else? Okay. 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 We're That's making our lot. list and checking it twice. I'm sure we love <laughs> you. We're checking our list. Okay. Is Mariah making on there? She's oh. Oh, Miss Christmas. Miss Christmas. Okay. She's busy from now until the 25th, yeah. but then she can fit in. Okay. All right. Usher, thank, thank you, Usher. Enjoy this rose. Oh, my gosh. We're, We're going to dry this and keep it forever. Mm, savor it. Write it in our journal. <laughs> but come to the show, please. Come to we, Vegas. We will. And see the Vegas we will. He invited us. We will. We have to go. Dear Diary, Usher invited us to come to Dear his Dear Diary, show. this is the rose he gave to us when he sang for us. Usher, thank you're a, thank an, you. an amazing father thank and a thank great thank human you. being. Thank you. Let's take this pledge, you guys. Okay. Take the pledge, y'all. Coming up, find your perfect fall wine. That's a transition right after this. and queso, Sunny and Cher. We love a duo around here, don't we? We sure do. And today we are talking about one of the most sophisticated pairings around and one of my favorites, wine and cheese. Mm. Here to help us out is author of Brunch Gods, Garvey Alexander. Hi, Garvey. Hi. Hi. How are you? Wine and cheese do feel like they were sort of made They're for each other. Perfect combination, honestly, the perfect marriage. I'm a new judge with the Tasting Alliance. We run the most prestigious awards in the booze industry. Wow. The San Francisco Spirit Awards. And this one, best in class. Ooh. This one right here? Yes, so this is the Lubinazzi Chenin Blanc. Oh, I like a Chenin Blanc. I, think. I don't even know what that is. What is it? It's like kind of Chardonnay, like Chenin, This This actually captures the essence of Cape Town in every sip. Mm. This is a South African Chenin Blanc. So the mm, varietal like nice. is from South Africa. Nice. We have it paired with prosciutto, dried apricots, some nuts. Mm -hmm. It's simply delicious. Another white wine you have, you like? Yes, I love this Wander and Ivy. It's a single serving Look of at the single wine. Serving. I know, that's cute. It's so cute. The vessel's amazing. Adorable. I mean, forget the flask. You can just pop, pop this into your bag <laughs> instead. It's a good, like, part yeah. picnic situation. It right? is, it is. It's perfect for, it's perfect all year round, honestly. Yeah. Um, and I love this because of how elegant the uh, mm -hmm. vessel looks. Not mm -hmm. only that, the Sauvignon Blanc has notes of guava, it's has good. notes of apple. Mm -hmm. It's real subtle. I can see this on an airplane. You have the most yeah. soothing voice in the entire world. <laughs> Thank you so much. Did you always have I that mean, level wait, of a me, voice? Me soothing yes. after Usher? I mean, I appreciate I mean, that. come on, come on. <laughs> I appreciate on. it. It's, you have got it. It's what I do. I love that. This okay. is tenfold. So I call this Pierce Brosnan and Sean Connery. I feel like 007 every time mm. I take a sip of either. Is it luxurious? It's uh, so elegant. It's so sophisticated. 
located right here we have the bin 704 this is going to be our cabernet okay. you're going to get dried tobacco notes sage allspice mm, raw nutmeg oh i love that i know i, I mean i'm gonna have to take one of these glasses this is a great <laughs> winter oh, winter beautiful. wine you it's can have delicious. this one do you want. chill that or do you just drink it room temp i just drink mine room temperature uh -huh. although it'd be great with the cube if you like it a little I lighter i like it chilled red uh -huh. so i had to double up on penfolds i'm doing the bin 600 which is going to be 32 percent shiraz and 68 like percent cabernet and with oh, this that's is a good combo it yeah. is and you see you can see that it's more of a crimson color yeah it's more of a red cherry flavor there's a bit of mocha a bit of dark chocolate note to it as well to the mm. finish it's just mm. as mm. It's good these it's are like good. that's delicious yeah these i feel like feel a secret like, agent every uh, time both of these feel like good thanksgiving wines mm -hmm. right honestly all of these will be great for your holiday season but They'll, they're great options year round as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great options year round as well. Okay. So I'm sipping on Liars right now. It's a non alcoholic sparkling. Um, you don't have to feel guilty missing out on a champagne yeah. toast anymore. That's kind of nice. We have mm -hmm. an amazing selection. This is also award winning as well as the Lubinazzi in the front. So mm. this you'll get mm. the classic notes of green apple. I like that. Richness of pear, mm -hmm. but it still has that spark and bubble. Does it come in single serving too, or is that and something else? And it comes else? in a single serving. Oh, as well. These are Those cute. Are cute. Little yeah. Pack. yeah, these um, are for you guys to take home and enjoy. Oh my Garby, gosh, thank, thank you, you so, so much for having Of course. Happy and I'm your voice is really sweet. Isn't it? Uh -huh. I mean, I'm mesmerized. <laughs> Me too. Thank you All so right. much. Coming up, now that we have happy hour covered, let's go to dinner. We'll meet in the kitchen for our favorite weeknight meal after this. Who's in our kitchen this morning? Home chef and cookbook author, Patel Pat Pala. Pala. Hold on, <laughs> hold on. Palak Patel. Palak Patel. You got it. Yeah, Palak is whipping Thank up you. a delicious recipe from her debut cookbook, The Chutney Life: 100 Easy to Make Indian-Inspired Recipes. Palak, welcome. Thank you. Thank we're you so for having me. We're so happy that you're I'm here. I'm so excited and to be we're here. Very we, excited. We to feel try like this, out. this is a great weeknight kit. Yes. Such you, a great weeknight meal, and it's really fall forward. Okay. You know, spaghetti squash is super great for fall, so I'm excited. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Talk so to tell us. us what we should do. All right. So we've got our spaghetti squash here. I've mm -hmm. already sliced this in half and we're just going to drizzle this with a little bit of oil okay. and salt and pepper and then this gets roasted. So you just scraped it out? No, yeah. no big deal? That was it? Okay. All the seeds and mm -hmm. all the kind okay. of middle flesh so super quick and then salt, and all of it. Okay. salt really well mm -hmm. that's going to add a lot of that flavor in there mm -hmm. and then we've got our pepper mm -hmm. and you can be as generous as you like with this cool and then we're going to roast this cut side down that's going to help ah, the inside of this flesh cut side cook. down okay. plus you're going to get these golden caramel edges and that's okay. where you get a lot of flavor how, how long, long do you so roast that, that for in the oven 375 for about 45 to 50 minutes okay. until it's really nice and golden okay, okay. Now. While that cooks, we're gonna make our sauce. So I've got some oil here, and mm -hmm. this is where we add a lot of great flavor. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, so we've got cumin seeds. These are gonna start to kind of sizzle mm -hmm. and crackle in the hot oil. And then adding your spices to the oil is just a great way to add that what depth and that? flavor. These are mustard seeds. Oh, oh mustard it's very, seeds. It's just, they're, they're 
crunchy. They mm -hmm. have this kind of little bit of zing to them. And so we're going to cook these, okay. and they're going to get really nice mm -hmm. and toasty. How long you cook them for about 10 minutes? I'd say about 10 minutes, and you want to kind of hear them crackle and pop, and okay. that's when you know, all right, it's going to okay. it's ready. ready to go. Mm -hmm. And then we've got our aromatics. So mm -hmm. We've got garlic, ginger, green chilies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you don't like spice, you could always leave these out. And we've got some diced red onion. So all of this, okay. we can put in there. You yeah, that? you okay. can do that. And, um, I'll do this. I will, okay. yeah. So if, if you're making it for kids, do you leave out the green chilies? Probably? You can leave out the green chilies, but the garlic and ginger is not going to add kick. It's just no. going to add flavor. Yeah. So I make this for my kids all the time. Right. Mm -hmm. I'll add a little extra butter and cheese for my yeah. children. So, and then you can add whatever veggies you like as well. So this is really versatile. Okay. If you want to add meat, you could add mm, meat. Smell that, we smell add that these already. spices? Smell yes. That already. And the, so I've got tandoori masala, garam masala, and cumin. So it's just mm -hmm. really warm and mm -hmm. yummy. And spices, some tomato paste? Tomato paste. This is going to add a beautiful color along with just like a really great buttery tomato mm -hmm. sauce. We're going to cook this down until it's really nice and so it looks golden. Like what we have Which yeah. is over here. So then we get here and the flavors are going to develop. Those spices have a mm -hmm. chance to kind of blend together. To this we're going to add some butter yeah. mm -hmm. um, because that's just going to add that richness mm -hmm. and creaminess to this sauce. And then we have a little bit of chicken broth. This is going to help thin the sauce out a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then to that, a little bit of good old cream. Cool. Um, and again, cozy, mm -hmm. really great fall meal. This is the fun part right here. So this is your yes. cooked squash. Cooked yes. squash. So and this now is what you're it gonna... looks like. It's going to be golden. You scoop it out. You've got strands. And this is what you end up with with the sauce. And you don't even need to do anything just Super scoop easy. it out. You, you just scoop it up, and it's going to turn into these kind of like spaghetti strands, yeah. as you see. Oh, it's They're real. Um, Super easy. It's, you know, nature, Mother Nature's version of. And it's kind of a, a way mm. to get veggies, but it's like a noodle. Yeah. Oh my gosh! It's like a noodle, and so you don't miss the pasta. Is that so yummy? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, it's that a great is meal for super, fall. super mm. yummy. Thank you. I'm glad thank you enjoyed it. Thank you so it. much, Pollock. Thank that you. That is yeah. delicious. All right. Thank you. Well, those recipes and more go to today.com/slash/food. Thank wow. you. Yummy. Coming up. What's the name? of that thing uh -huh. or staff or Sean. He gives us the clues that we answer. You know, we guess. I'm not sure what you're saying. Okay, well, play this game with us right after this. Mm. This is delicious. Mm. So glad you guys mm. like it. I know, I feel like... that we do when we're trying to think of somebody's name and all you can do is like list a bunch of random things about them. Yeah, I mean, I kind of know what you're talking about. We know it actually so well that we made a game of it. It's called, oh, what's, what's the, the name, name of this game, game again? again? And here to host it is our associate producer, Sean. Hi. Sean is also the king of Halloween. Yeah, he made yesterday on. possible. Yes, thank you, Sean. Uh, me and Mariah Carey. Uh -huh. No, no, she's Christmas. Oh, God, you're right. Sorry. <laughs> Let's move on. Okay. Here's how the game will work. I will list off a rambling assortment of vaguely informed clues as, as if I have forgotten the names of famous people, TV shows, songs, whatever. If you know what I'm talking about, buzz in okay. and guess. Okay. Okay. First up, who's that woman? She's that actress with the cool name, and she's on that. Oh, no, keep okay. going. And she's on that one show like forever. She still is. Issa Rae? No. Reba? No. <laughs> this, the show's still going. Um, she's always in like a blazer, and it's a spinoff of a different show. But this one is like blazer? sex crimes or like special. Oh, Riska Hargitay. Oh, yeah. Hargitay. Jenna gets the point. You got me at sex crimes. Okay. Yes, that will do it. <laughs> it happens. Who's that guy? He was that singer with like the deep, sexy voice, and but he'd always like start a song by like just talking, and he'd say things like, "Girl, 
All the times that we... I sure? No. No. All the times that we shared love and, and made love. And God, I know this song. Enough. That is. And, but then he would sing and he'd be like, I'm never, I'm never, never gonna, gonna give you up. I'm never, never going to stop. I don't know. Tom Jones? No, but it was in that era. It was like big oh. in the 70s, 80s. He's like a bigger guy. Um, it starts Marvin like, Gaye? No, uh, like, Gosh. not Larry. Um, okay, tell Barry. us. Let's move on. Barry, Barry Manilow! No. no, Barry White. Yes. Uh, Down to the buzzer. Uh, that was close. That was hard. Yeah, that was yeah. hard. Well, what's that show? Um, it was with the mother and the daughter, and they lived in that, like, perfect town with the gazebo. Gilmore Girls. Yeah. Yes. All he had to do was say mother and daughter. And it's gazebo. True that. <laughs> and gazebo. Okay, who's that woman? We love her. Um, she's that really great singer, and everyone thinks she looks exactly like um, uh, Donna Summer. And she um, had that song with Nelly, and then, but before that, she was in that group. It was like her and Michelle. Oh, go B, B. Wait. Oh, oh, I know yeah. her. Okay, well, what's her Who? name? Wait, she was from um, Destiny's Child. Yes. yes. Um, her name it's is Michelle and Beyonce. Kelly Rowland. Kelly oh, Rowland. You're welcome. For the record, I would never forget Kelly Rowland's name. No, I love Ke I did not forget Kelly Rowland. I Rowan. never forgot I never for one did. second. Okay. Not forget. Who's that woman? She's from like thousands of years ago? Maybe hunt No, I think it's thousands. Cleopatra? Yes. Wait, what? It was wow. just a guess, but I was Cleopatra for Halloween once. <laughs> Good job. Thank nice you. job. Okay, who's that woman? She's an actress. She was on that show years ago with like um, <laughs> Tony and Christopher and Polly Walnuts, and she was Polly married Walnut? to the main guy. The Sopranos? Yeah, but who's the actress? Who's the woman? Edie Falco. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> no, I stole it right. That's, a, that's, that's back okay. for Kelly that's Rowland. Okay. All right, last one. Okay. The John already won. Who's that guy? He's the mean British guy, and he'd always like. Simon Cow. Yeah. No. But he's always like calling people donkeys and like going into restaurants and yelling about meat being raw. And he's, he's he has like 12 TV shows. He's that chef. Sasha Baron Cohen? No, oh, the, the chef. chef. Um, he's Brit mean British chef. He yells at. Oh, oh, oh Gordon Ramsay. Yeah. Yes, Gordon Ramsay. Yeah. <laughs> Jenna's won yet again. And you, what you're do you gonna get? get what you've always wanted is a famed photo of me as Hollywood <laughs> Hater. You knew I was gonna win. Yeah, so you can just put that up Lisa in your Rena home. Oh, I'm gonna slash. take this to Mila, so she'll be the strangest oh my kid God. in her class. Oh my God. I don't know how I feel about By you the way. a photo of me in her bedroom, but. Well, especially dressed Sean. up as a cat yeah. with boobs. Um, okay, Sean, we love you. We love you, Sean. Thank okay, you. and we'll be back right after this. <laughs> Sean, you're a master at this game. Wednesday. Thank you for hanging out with us yeah, okay, today. To vote for which song Usher should perform in the Super Bowl, and y'all should vote, go to HodaAndJenna.com. And also to vote on who he should partner up with for is one song. Is it Alicia? Is it Bieber? Be, could be. Or is it B? Beyonce. We, we don't, don't know. know. Okay, and tomorrow y'all we have actress and singer Vanessa Hutchins Plus, is here. one of our favorite foodies, Reed Drummond, will be Ooh, I here. I love her. See you tomorrow. All right, bye.
Oh, oh, hi there. Craig Melvin here, filling in for Al Roker on this episode of Family Style. And today, well, today we're talking, talking all about one of the country's most popular desserts and a holiday staple. We're talking about pie. And as a, a southerner and a pie lover, pecan, pecan here, it's my favorite, not pecan, pecan. So this assignment was almost too good to be true. From our Thanksgiving tables to our 4th of July barbecues to Christmas and the winter holidays, pie is central to so many of our celebrations. Homemade or baked at, at wonderful shops like this one called Michelle's Pies in Connecticut. Americans sure have strong fillings for pie. See what I did there? But how did we become a nation of pie people? Join me as I slice into the significance of this iconic dessert and piece together how and why different pies are so important to communities across this country. Mm. Time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. Yes, pecan might be my favorite, but this, this is my second favorite. I'm a huge fan of a good old-fashioned sweet potato pie. And I'm not alone. For millions of black Americans, making a sweet potato pie is a meaningful tradition this time of year. And in Minneapolis, one woman stopped selling her highly sought after sweet potato pie and with the help of her family, started giving them away for free. Now, through her nonprofit, she is bringing generations together to bake and then gift her tasty pies. It's a recipe for spreading love and creating meaningful connections. You could say they're baking the world a better place. Here's to the joy of our blackness, our beauty, ooh, our energy, our power. Yeah. Really. <laughs> Just being able to come together in unity. Onward. 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 That's Rose McGee, the founder of the Sweet Potato Comfort Pie. On a fall morning, a group of women gathered at her home just outside Minneapolis. I appreciated young Brittany Wright uh, approaching me and saying, Ms. Ms. Rose, you really should teach us young women how to make sweet potato pie. I'll just take a little piece of the shell itself and just slide it in there and that'll pull it right out a lot easier than trying to use a spoon because it's thicker. Gotcha. Passing a tradition from one generation to the next. Mama Rose is really good at bringing people together, making them feel welcome and having a sense of belonging. And so I thought it'd be really cool on my birthday to bring a bunch of women together, sharing experiences, learning how to bake pies, learning something from the African-American tradition. Each attendee will be making three pies to share with their community. One to keep, one to gift to an elder, and one to gift to someone younger than them. Once we got the first batch of sweet potatoes boiling, I started exhaling. When you peel, always go to the tip, and then it just pulls right off. For Rose, sweet potato pod is not just dessert, it's a catalyst for connection, one that she considers sacred. It seems like it's all about the pie, but really the pie just happens to be the sweet spot that brings people together. I used to sell the pies years ago. No idea that one day I would feel compelled to give them away. Not to sell them, but to give them away. I started Sweet Potato Comfort Pie in 2014, not really realizing that that's what I was doing after the killing of young Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri. And I was sitting there watching television. I felt this calling. I obeyed that calling and made about 30 pies, packed them in my car, and my son Adam drove down with me. But what I discovered was people wanted to be heard and listened to. They wanted to feel that um, they were being respected. 
So I took that to heart and brought it back home. Back in Minneapolis, when George Floyd was killed, Rose stayed up all night baking pies to take to the memorial site to help her own community heal. And I didn't know what to do except make some pies. And that's why I know it's, it's, it's not just about me. It's bigger than that. Is anybody really gonna respond to that? And people do. The organization's mission is to strengthen and cultivate relationships with the solidarity and story sharing that is part of making and receiving the pie. I'm not trying to over emotionalize anything, <laughs> but I will say it's something when people allow you to feel purpose mm -hmm. and allow you to see That's beauty it. within yourself. The sweet potato pie we know today was inspired from West African cuisine and dates back centuries. To get to the root of its origins, we must first talk about yams. I'm Rossi Nastapulo. I'm the author of Sweet Land of Liberty, A History of America in 11 Pies. So a yam is an old world crop and a sweet potato is a new world crop. And so yams are really an important part of the West African diet. Whereas sweet potatoes, they are grown kind of on this side of the world. In the United States, sweet potatoes grew abundantly in the South. Enslaved black Americans tended to these crops and cooked with them, contributing to many of the sweet potato recipes we know today. However, credit to black chefs and cooks didn't come until the late 1800s. There was Melinda Russell's A Domestic Cookbook and then Abby Fisher's What Mrs. Fisher Knows About Old Southern Cooking. And so these are two black authored cookbooks that included recipes for sweet potato pie and really were an opportunity for these black chefs and cooks to reclaim their knowledge and have the credit given to them. When emancipation comes, they continue to make sweet potato pie and this time they're making it for themselves, their families and their communities. So you're just gonna put in a third of the way. For those close to the sweet potato comfort pie, it's what's in the batter that really truly matters. Antoinette Pearson Edinger is a pastry chef and helps manage the kitchen at sweet potato comfort pie gatherings. I was at the first meeting in here in Rose's living room. When I was growing up, if there were some trauma in a family or some celebration in a family, you went down the street with the pies in your hand to present to the family that was either in need or is celebrating and communicate with the folks that are there. She, oh, the pies are ready. <laughs> Today, back in Rose's kitchen is one of those celebrations in honor of Brittany's birthday. What I appreciate about this, we have been in responsive mode. We try to respond to these crises that happen across the country and locally. So to do something more celebratory is very uplifting and very inspiring for us all. It's a sisterhood. Through these pies, through Mama Rose, we're able to celebrate each other, empower each other, encourage each other, and we're doing it in a way through unity. The future of Sweet Potato Comfort Pie I believe it's a good one. Everybody has this need of wanting to connect. And when you're baking a pie, you just, you're gonna connect. The heart of the comfort pie connection is love and a commitment to greater good. And of course, always keeping their eyes on the pie. When in doubt, bring a bunch of black women into the kitchen and we'll figure it out. Coming up, a family in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, whose ancestors helped invent a sticky dessert that's still being served up today.
And welcome back to Family Style. And another pie rich with history and a little sugar as well. Some say the origin of this pie known as shoe fly can be traced back to a cake, specifically the Centennial Cake. It first appeared in Philadelphia circa 1876, celebrating the 100th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. And while the exact origins of the shoe fly pie are lost to time, no matter how you slice it, it is a true American original. In the heart of Pennsylvania's bucolic Amish country lies a town with a name that sounds like a familiar adage. Burton Hand is nestled in Lancaster County. A lot of farming, a lot of agriculture, and a lot of really good, hardworking people. It just has a peaceful and calm feeling. It just envelops you. Bird in Hand isn't just the name of this small village. It's also the namesake of a family-owned corporation that runs a group of lodges, a campground, and eateries. John Smucker runs the business. Under his wings, the Bird in Hand Bakery and Cafe, best known for its shoe fly pie. Raised Mennonite, John and his wife Myrna have deep roots in this neck of the woods. My family's story in Pennsylvania begins in 1752 when my immigrant ancestor Christian Schmucker uh, emigrated from Switzerland and Germany, came to America, established a farm homestead here in Lancaster County. And I'm the eighth generation. Pennsylvania Dutch refers to immigrants who came to the U.S. from German-speaking countries in the 18th and 19th centuries, mainly to escape religious persecution in Europe. By the late 1700s, it's estimated that these immigrants accounted for more than a third of Pennsylvania's population. Well, that'd be the new farmer. He's out there doing it. John's ancestors, along with countless others, brought with them new types of cuisine and helped invent that sticky dessert that's famous in this region. Shoe fly pie. The origins of shoe fly pie are a little bit murky. One historian traces it back to centennial cake, which was made in the 1800s as a celebration of Pennsylvania's centennial. Shoe fly pie, an apple pan, and it makes your eyes light up. And so that was a crustless version that then once it becomes placed in a crust to become more easily transportable, that turns into shoe fly pie. The Smucker family has been serving up their family shoe fly pie to the public for more than 50 years. And they've been baking it for much longer. But what exactly is shoe fly pie? I'd start with delicious. The topping is different, so it's not so sweet pecan pie with no pecans. <laughs> Shoe fly pie is a type of molasses pie. It's really a product of Pennsylvania Dutch cuisine, and it's distinguished by its inclusion of streusel, which is very classic to those types of European cuisines. On the frontier, they had a limited amount of ingredients, a limited amount of resources, and so one of the products that they would have had was molasses, and molasses was stable. Most shoe fly pies include molasses. The smuckers, however, do things a little differently. We do not use a molasses product for our shoe fly pie. We gravitate towards a light table syrup. Another unique feature of shoe fly pie, the traditional ingredients don't require refrigeration, making it a convenient treat for the many Amish residents in this part of the country. That's Anna Mary Smucker, or to those who knew and loved her, Grussy. Uh, my grandmother, Anna Mary Smucker, was the one who I would say was the ultimate pie baker in our family. I'm sure she picked up recipes from her mother who picked them up from her mother before that. In a 1938 edition of National Geographic on the Pennsylvania Dutch, Grussy was even featured with four of her kids, including John's dad and a shoe fly pie. John comes from a long line of bakers, influenced by his grandparents and his parents. My mother was a pie baker, so she was a busy cook and a housekeeper. And my father was out on the farm and doing different businesses, and so she uh, was busy in the kitchen taking care of the family. In 1970, John's father, Paul, opened the family's first restaurant. There, they started serving the family's signature pie to locals and tourists. In the mid-80s, John opened another nest for foodies. 
Bird in Hand Bakery and Cafe, just to keep up with the soaring demand for their baked goods. Pumpkin pie, shoe fly pie, and cherry crumb pie. Ah, uh, I just love pies. The pies here are all made from scratch, including the ooey gooey wet bottom shoe fly using Smucker's recipe that's been passed down for generations. And apparently, this pie isn't just for dessert. I have it for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, but not necessarily every day. What's delicious on the plate first needs to take shape. And we like our shoe fly pies to be sweet and smooth. There are two main components, the goo and the crumbs. The wet filling is made with hot water, light table syrup, light brown sugar, baking soda, and eggs. It's stirred with a canoe paddle-sized kitchen tool. So to us, the goo is one of the most important features of the pies. That filling is poured into a homemade pie crust. The pie's signature crumb topping is made with pastry flour, light brown sugar, cinnamon, salt, and shortening, which is combined in a large mixer. Crumbs go on top, and then this goo is down below in a layer that's about a half an inch thick. When we bake it, the crumbs work down through into the pie a bit and um, help to create what I call that middle layer. Back when Grussy made her pies, she didn't shoo the grandkids away. She just let us dig in. After about an hour in the oven, the pies are cool, covered, and carried right from the kitchen to the bakery. While visitors to this bakery savor unforgettable flavors and a pinch of the past, for John and his family, the pies are symbolic of so much more. My grandmother would always say, give good measure. She was a very hospitable person. I see pies as part of hospitality. These folks are proudly carrying on a unique Pennsylvania Dutch tradition here in the land known as Bird and Hand. Coming up, a New York City baker's quest to bring back a long lost Christmas time pie. Pie today, gone tomorrow. That's what, that's what seemed to be the fate of a beloved bygone Christmas time pie. It was popular for, well, a New York minute. Well, I guess a few decades to be exact. But today, one bakery in New York City is bringing back this long forgotten chestnut rum and cherry creation called Nestle Road. It's not your traditional a pumpkin, apple, or, or blueberry dessert, but it is a treat that many older of New Yorkers probably remember from childhood. Served up with a slice of nostalgia 
and a memory of decadent New York. Our motto at PD's is damn fine pie for damn fine people <laughs> because we're just so proud to be a New York business. Pie has been a part of New York's culinary history the entire time and we just wanted to elevate it the best we could. I'm Petra Paredes and I am the owner and head baker of PD's Pie Company. PD's Pie, named after Petra's childhood nickname, has been serving up damn fine pie since opening in New York City in 2014. We opened up the Tuesday before Thanksgiving. We sold like 100 pies. And then the next year, we sold 1,000 pies. This past Thanksgiving, nearly a decade after opening, Petey's sold 10,000 pies. The big holiday rush isn't new to Petra. She grew up pulling all-nighters before Thanksgiving in the name of pie. Pie's been part of my life since I was born. I was born into my parents' bakery. <laughs> they have a bakery called Mom's Apple Pie Company in Virginia. And I always spent my Thanksgivings working at their shop. They are still in business and they still do tremendous Thanksgiving business. Petra inherited a love of baking from her dad. My dad is really obsessive about quality of ingredients and that's something that I have learned from him to just be really focused on flavor and on like the texture and balance in a pie. Petra left the family pie business and moved to New York City to pursue a career in teaching. It was at the end of my first year of teaching that I met my husband, Robert. Seemingly, against all odds, it was poker that brought Petra back to pie. He, interestingly enough, was playing poker <laughs> professionally at the time. He wanted a place to invest his poker money. <laughs> and so I sort of half-jokingly asked him if he wanted to open a pie bakery with me. Robert didn't call her bluff. And he said yes. We'd been dating a few weeks <laughs> at the time. And we spent the next three years planning it. Petey's menu offers the classics like apple, banana cream, key lime, and also a beloved bygone pie. The couple's love of culinary history led to Nestle Road's discovery and return. One of the things that Robert and I used to do as we were planning our business was we would look at the New York Public Library's menu database, which is really fun. And one pie that we kept seeing over and over that we had never heard of and never tried and weren't sure how to pronounce <laughs> was Nestle Road Pie. It was on a lot of sort of mid-century menus from the 1940s through the 1960s. This elusive pie piqued Petra's interest. Stumbling across Nestle Road on these old menus was sort of like uh, discovering a fossil or something. Petra saw this as a chance to bring back a piece of decadent New York. Her curiosity inspired a sweet revival. Nestle Road wasn't always a pie. It actually started as a frozen custard dessert in sort of the Victorian ages. It's a very decadent thing to have a frozen dessert before, you know, refrigeration was widely available. It was like the most fancy dessert you could imagine. First off, it was named after a Russian diplomat by his private French chef. Not to mention its luxurious ingredients of chestnuts and liqueur. Years later, the Big Apple heavily influenced the evolution of this decadent dessert. It went from a pudding mold to a pie crust. It sort of transformed in New York City in around the 1940s by this woman named Hortense Spire. Baking the pies from her Upper West Side brownstone, the pie quickly gained popularity. She made pies for like all of the fancy New York City restaurants, all the steakhouses and all the fancy fish seafood restaurants. The pie was a mid-century marvel. As demand grew and the pie became a New York City diner and sweet shop staple, many renditions no longer included chestnuts. By the mid-60s, it all but faded into oblivion. Nestle Road is one of Petey's holiday season offerings, but the supply is limited. Because it's so labor intensive, we can only make 80 over the course of the week. In creating her Nestle Road pie recipe, Petra sought to honor the origins of the dessert 
I wanted to bring that chestnut uh, part of the flavor profile and bring it sort of front and center. My recipe is almost sort of a mashup of the sort of Hortense Spire 1940s era and the New York Diner 1960s era. All of Petey's pies start with the same crust. My crust is based on my dad's recipe. It pushes the limits with one ingredient. My crust recipe has like a eight to nine ratio of butter to flour, which is really high. Next up, preparing the chestnuts for roasting. I puree the chestnuts with sugar and with rum, and that is sort of the base note flavor of the whole pie. The filling's light, delicate texture is achieved using gelatin. It's sort of like a, a chiffon or like a fluffy custard kind of pie. The filling is then chilled. We did like a Swiss meringue. The meringue is folded into the filling. Time to top with ganache. And of course, the final step, a cherry on top. They're actually sour cherries. When I hear that somebody um, who hasn't tried Nestle Road Pie since, they, since the 1960s tried my Nestle Road Pie and loved it and just got a sense of nostalgia out of it, it really sort of brings a, a whole other layer of meaning into, into the work that I do. Outside of the bakery, Petra and Robert are raising three little pie people with a fourth on the way. My kids are really into pie. They really love to eat pies. As for if their kids will share a slice of the shop one day. Who knows if they'll want to continue the pie business. I look forward to passing on everything that I know, just like my parents did, and, um, and seeing if they're interested. For most Americans, it seems that there's always room for pie. And the significance of that slice can adapt to circumstances, places, and people. Through pie, it seems we can more deeply understand not just our country's history, but our own sweetened memories. The hills are alive with the sights and smells and tastes. Ah, come on, it's a food show. Now, nothing says autumn quite like apple. Whether it's a trip to an orchard like this, a warm slice of apple pie, or cheering with cider. But when did apples become the apple of America's eye? I left the Big Apple, and I'm here in Massachusetts, where America's history with apples actually began. So today, we are going to get to the core of how apples became a homegrown hero. How do you like them apples? Time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. 
Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. My family and I have been coming here to Hilltop Orchards in Massachusetts for the past 20 years. That's right. In fact, you'd be hard pressed to find a better fall family activity than apple picking, and especially the apple cider donuts. And of course, what also pairs well with a trip to orchards? Cider. And they make a lot of it here at Hilltop. Oh, and did I mention the donuts? Meet David and Sarah Martell, high school sweethearts who reconnected in their 30s. Together, they run Hilltop Orchards. We're definitely an apple orchard, but we're also a winery and a cidery, so we're a triple threat. Today, David handles the operations of the orchard, cidery, and winery, with Sarah focusing on guest experience. The orchard's historic cider mill, where David played as a kid, was renovated in 1997. Now, they call it home. I started coming to this orchard when I was about six years old. My father worked here then. David left the Berkshires and worked in construction for several years. When he decided to return home, he really went back to his roots, taking a part-time job at Hilltop. I've been in the orchard business for about 12 years now. David's the third generation in his family to work on the 100-something-year-old orchard. Did you ever think that you would be running the orchard someday? Nah, in a million years. I quickly fell in love with these apple trees and decided that's what I'm going to do. Diving in and learning about all the different apples and the history of apples. And that history is pretty sweet. I like to think of myself as an apple nerd. <laughs> My name is Amy Traverso, and I'm the senior food editor at Yankee Magazine and the author of the Apple Lover's Cookbook. Crab apples are the only variety indigenous to North America. Sweet apples were introduced to America by early colonists in the 1600s. Sweet apples have their origins in this area of Western China, sort of the border between Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan, called the Tian Shan Mountain Range. Those apple seeds came over with the Jamestown Expedition, and trees were planted at Plymouth. But in the early days, colonists weren't making pies and tarts. Most apples grown in America at that time were more likely to be turned into cider than eaten. Apples played a very important role when there was people coming from England. As they say on the boat, they would make hard cider because that cider would last where water might spoil and someone would get sick. This trend continued stateside. By 1775, 10% of all New England farms had a cider mill. Today, I am at B.F. Clyde Cider Mill in Old Mystic, Connecticut. Meet Amy Harrison and her daughter, Sarah Monk, fifth and sixth generation owners of Clyde's. We're the last original steam-powered cider mill in the United States. Back in you know the 1800s, early 1900s, everybody had a cider mill that had a farm. We use the same press, it's the same mill, and not many people get to go to work and put their hands on a lever and say, you know what, my great-great-grandfather did this same thing back in 1898. Cider was really important to early America because it was relatively easy to make. People had apples in abundance. And Thomas Jefferson and John Adams famously loved it, drank it every day. Children drank it because it was low in alcohol, but it was often safer than water. Water could often be contaminated at that time. These days, Americans don't drink as much cider as the founding fathers. Two things happened to kind of bring the apple to its knees. We had immigration from Germany and Czechoslovakia, which were beer growing regions. Beer took over as the major American drink. Another reason behind cider's decline? Prohibition. Apples were very strongly associated with cider at the time. They were really seen as a source of alcohol. My great-great-grandmother was arrested twice, never convicted, but arrested twice for um, bootlegging. In the 1930s, Apple's sinful image was reborn as shipping methods improved. Sweet apples from Washington State could be transported all over the country, and the industry grew. 
apples then had to be remarketed as just a dessert thing, as something you bake with or eat fresh from your hand. And so apples, they went through this rebranding and emerged as this sort of innocent, sweet fruit that wasn't gonna get you drunk or do anything naughty. It was just gonna make a nice pie. <laughs> Now, even hard cider is making a comeback, due in large part to the craft beer boom in the late aughts. Gluten's having a moment, so people are shying away from a lot of beers. Cider is fermented apples, and that's it. Where a lot of other beverages or mixed drinks or anything of that nature could have a lot of preservatives and different things added to them. Today, Americans are drinking 10 times more cider than a decade ago, and that's meant big business for Hilltop. Most of our guests are cider enthusiasts that are relatively new to the cider craze. Hilltop making around 1,500 gallons daily, and I got a chance to give it a try, or a press. They say time to make the donuts, it's time to make the cider. So here's some gloves, I see okay. you brought your boots. Yeah, I did. The process starts with freshly picked apples that are washed thoroughly. Next up, culling. As Benjamin Franklin once said, the rotten apple spoils his companion. They're sorting through what's coming down the conveyor. This apple has some dings and bumps. The good apples are sent to the grinding wheel. And they will get ground up to an applesauce consistency. Now it's my turn to prepare the ground apples for pressing. So it's like an apple sludge diaper. That's it. Then the apples get pressed down to the last drop. That's 2,000 pounds of pressure per square inch. Up until this point, the process for sweet and hard cider is the same. Excellent. And nobody got hurt. Sweet cider would be bottled at this stage. For hard cider, the fermentation process begins. So sweet cider becomes more popular once we can refrigerate apple juice to prevent it from fermenting. In the mid 20th century, cider stands and apple picking became an American pastime, a tradition my family's enjoyed for more than 20 years each fall. There's just something about apple picking that inspires my best dad jokes. What apple sayings have you heard? There's a lot of um, insider sayings. <laughs> okay, I, I got one for you. Okay. okay. They say the family that plays together stays together. The family that picks together sticks together. There you go. As far as my kids are concerned, my jokes are as much a part of our annual tradition as the apples themselves. It's like, oh, dad. <laughs> <laughs> My family's been coming to Hilltop for more than 20 years, even before my two youngest were born. I don't know if it's something about the season when apples ripen and it's starting to get cooler and you're thinking about like comforts of home and coziness. People have very intense emotional connections with apples. Agritourism in the United States started becoming popular during the Industrial Revolution when city dwellers looked to nature for recreation. 
labor shortages during and after World War II saw farmers calling for volunteers to help pick crops. By the 1960s, enterprising farmers recognized America's love for apples. In the fall, the you-pick tradition became a profitable pastime at orchards all across the country. Is there a right way or and a wrong way to pick an apple? Spoiler alert, there is a wrong way. The problem with twisting and pulling the apple is that if it is not ripe, you're going to also get next year's apple. Can you show me? I can. So this is an apple that I know is not ready to pick yet. Okay. So if we were to lift up on this, uh -huh. if it was ripe, it would come free. Right. So it did not come free. Okay, right next to it is some Macintosh apples. Okay. And if you go ahead and lift up on one at a kind of a, at an angle into the sky, it comes it comes Just free. Like that. So that means that it's ripe. Okay, and the other thing is, well, that's the worst thing you can do when oh. you're picking an apple. So we we treat these like eggs and oh. we place them in place the bucket. Them in the bucket. There's sometimes little brown spots on them. That's from fingers. Oh. So the worst thing that you can do to somebody with a farm stand or, or a fruit grower is grab their apples and start squeezing them. I do like the Honeycrisp. Honeycrisp yeah. it is. I was gala, but uh, okay. I've moved to the Honeycrisp. With an empty nest, I thought this year's Roker family trip was gonna look pretty different. But then I heard from my boy at college. Nick was very adamant about Okay, are you gonna come pick me up so I can go apple picking? Because I thought, this'll be the first year we don't have anybody to apple pick with. Right. Much to my delight, the family that picks together does stick together. American Pie is certainly an American icon. And in Southern California, one local family's pies have achieved all American status. And this holiday season, they're gearing up to make over 50,000 of these each week. I love apple pie. I, every time I eat apple pie, I think, man, my mom just hit it out of the park. I'm Dave Smothers. I'm Tim Smothers. And our mother started the Julian Pie Company in 1986. From a young age, Liz Smothers developed a passion and a knack for baking. She often tells the story of standing on a milk crate next to her mom. I was probably four or five years old. I would crawl up on a box and take the little leftover pieces of dough and put them in a jar lid. I would put the little apple in my jar lid and cover it, and she would bake it in the oven 
just along with hers, and uh, I would eat it. I would say that if I had not had that experience, I would never be in the pie business. In the early 80s, the Smothers family moved to Julian, California, a picturesque mountain town near San Diego. Funds were tight, so my mom uh, ended up taking odd jobs. When we moved here, I had to go to work. The only place that a job was available was in a bakery. And uh, I, I tell you, after I started working with pie making, that old love just came right back. That love was mutual. Liz's pies were in high demand at the local bakeries where she worked, quickly gaining a loyal following. She had built up a reputation. There were stories that they would go in and go, well, I want one of her pies, and point at my mom. A historic gold mining town, Julian thrives thanks to agriculture, namely its award-winning apples. So once we came out here to Julian, and uh, she saw the opportunity. She just never looked back. Wild horses couldn't have stopped me. Honestly, I was not thinking of how much money can I make. I just was dying to make a, a good pie like my mother made. Two years after moving to Julian, Liz opened her own shop, the Julian Pie Company. She was 50 years old, proving it's never too late to embark on a dream. My mom baked 120 pies and she sold out the first day. It was a, it was a great grand opening. In this shop, there's an apple pie for everyone. It's the apple crunch with vanilla ice cream. It's not too sweet and it's really fresh. This is the most amazing pie I have ever had in my life. From cherry apple to apple rhubarb, today, Julian has 15 unique apple pie varieties in rotation. Thank you so much. The most popular seller is the Dutch apple. My mom's kind of joke was that that's the pie that pays our rent. Today, the busy bakers here make up to 10,000 pies a day. Pie production beginning around 3 a.m. It's no surprise that fall is their busiest season. Thanksgiving's the Super Bowl, and, uh, and Christmas is like uh, another Super Bowl. The pies are primarily made by hand, starting off with four ingredients. Pie crust is just flour, water, shortening, salt. That's it. It's the way you handle the dough so you get a nice short bread crust rather than a chewy crust. The brothers say their mom had a gift for knowing just when to stop kneading to make it perfect. If you don't get the dough right, you might as well not have the business. Miguel's worked with my mom. He knows exactly the precise measurements of how to do things. We add a few hundred pounds of flour, very ice cold water. The twin arm mixer blends the dough. That's what I think of his grandma's hand. The 400 pound batch of dough heads to the extruder where it's cut into individual portions. So a 9.2 ounce puck falls into a pie shell, smashes the dough into a perfect shape, then they go into our freezers and we use them as needed. Next up, assembling the pies. Apples are peeled, sliced, then spiced. Cinnamon, sugar, and salt. This is all my mom's original recipe. There'll be a little bit of butter. Every time that dumps, I just get giddy. I'm like, yes, we hit it out of the park. So these pies have all been packed. They're nice and round, kind of like a mushroom. Patty's going to begin lifting, which is separating the, uh, the, the crust from the pie tin. If you don't do this step right here, that pie will bubble over in the oven. My mom was a queen fluter. The pies are brushed with an apple cider egg wash before baking. Then they're cooled, boxed, and ready to be shipped. Julian's pies are sold in hundreds of stores, including big grocery chains like Albertsons, as well as mom and pop shops throughout San Diego. My name's Sierra Smothers. I'm Liz Smothers' granddaughter. I grew up baking pies with my grandma. This job was actually my first job in high school. These days, Sierra pitches in wherever she's needed, including driving the delivery truck. I said, Sierra, do you want to spend the day with your dad and help me deliver pies? And she, of course, jumped at the opportunity. So we had a whole day together delivering pies. Everybody <laughs> loved it. Julian now has two locations, employing almost 70 people. So many admire their company's founder. It's the best spot. No, everything I do is very, how would Liz want it, want it done? Liz's perfectionism and attention to detail is really what's brought this company to the magnitude that it is. And if we don't carry that on, then what are we doing? <laughs> Liz passed away peacefully, surrounded by family in May but her legacy lives on through the beloved recipes her family works hard to preserve. I just hope that she's looking down and whatever that we do, we, we have her in our hearts and uh, that she's proud. Oh, this is where you get choked up. <laughs> now it's very, uh, it's very special, I really miss her. Um, she left a, a huge legacy with 
big shoes to fill. As for the future of Julian, the Smothers continue to welcome customers old and new with open arms. Come again, sweetie pie. That's my mom. Coming up next, a North Carolina family is giving candy apples a glow up with their colorful and creative creations. make apples even sweeter? Well, you dip them in candy, of course. Candy apples have long been associated with boardwalks and state fairs, but there's one entrepreneur in North Carolina who's taking this traditional treat to a whole new level with a colorful twist on the classic coating. My name is Kim Battle, and this is my husband, Travis Battle, and we are the owners of Candy, Candy Apples, Apples by K. K. Thank y'all. I would describe Candy Apples by K as the world's first hard candy candy apple shop. We specialize in the hard candy apple that started out with the traditional carnival treat, and then we've expanded that to different colors, different flavors. According to most historians, American-style candy apples were invented in New Jersey in the early 1900s. They're known for that signature cinnamon-flavored red shell until now. I like the uh, tropical punch. My favorite flavor is turtle. I would certainly say that the variety makes them special. For Kim and Travis, this treat has an especially sweet history. Candy apples have always been a favorite. My husband used to bring them to me when we were dating. And then when I threw his surprise 40th birthday party, I wanted him to have gold candy apples as a favor. We found someone to make them, and then she encouraged me, you know, you can make these yourself. You can do this yourself. Wanting to enjoy candy apples year round, Kim began developing unique candy recipes at home. Her kids, her first taste testers. Eventually, it picked up and neighbors and friends would say, oh, I would buy some from, from you if you have some. And I thought, let me start an Instagram page and see how many people are interested in candy apples. At this point, I'm working full time still uh, as an accountant. And on the weekends, I would start doing markets to offer these candy apples. When Kim got laid off, she saw an opportunity to pursue her dream full time. There's never been a storefront that just focused on candy apples and you love going in a cupcake shop and you're like, ooh, all the flavors and the beauty of having the case displayed of all these treats. And I thought that would be so yum to have the same thing, but just in Candy Apples. Candy Apples by K officially opened in April, 2019. A line of eager patrons stretched down the sidewalk on opening day. Any dream of hers, I'm definitely gonna support it. It's gonna become my dream as well. So we took off with it. Today, Kim and her team make over 40 different flavors and rotate their offerings each week. The process starts, of course, with fresh apples that Travis picks up from local farmers markets each weekend. Those are pretty. In our opinion, the Granny Smith apple is the best apple to use. That tart, hard, crisp apple is perfect against sweet candy. 
The apples are washed thoroughly in vinegar and hot water to remove that waxy coating. And it creates a smooth surface for the candy to be applied to. In the candy apple world, this is a dirty apple and this is a clean apple. The apples need to dry for 24 hours or else the candy coating won't stick properly. And this might just be my opinion, but the more I've dipped, I feel like covering the apple all the way to the stick is ideal for presentation. Kim's candy starts with a base of sugar, corn syrup, and water heated to 300 degrees. Then flavor extracts are added. She's experimented with dozens over the years, including blue raspberry, sour watermelon, and pina colada. And while we couldn't get her to divulge exactly how she gets those eye-popping colors, Kim did reveal one secret. Making sure that you're using bright colors and that your candy is not transparent would also be a key to making sure that you have a beautiful apple. Many apples get a little extra love with candy pieces or nuts. The store now offering a variety of dip treats, including candied grapes and chocolate dipped fruit. But the classics are always on standby. Our family favorites are definitely still the carnival. The turtle, which is caramel, milk chocolate, and pecans, is also a huge favorite. It's one that we can slice and share with everyone. And they really do mean everyone. We have five kids ranging uh, ages 2 to 22. They all contribute something different even to the family business and they're very familiar with candy apples. They're so used to seeing them that I think the five-year-old's first word was apple. It was apple. <laughs> Elena, the couple's oldest, works at the shop. She also handles their social media to help boost business. This is carrot cake. I feel it's really brought her out of her shell. I mean, she was an introvert and very quiet, but this has really blossomed her into being a lot more outgoing and engaging in conversation with customers. The younger kids continue to taste test while Travis pitches in where needed. He works full time, but still in the evenings at night, he's washing apples, he's stocking the store, he's getting all our supplies. I think often like, I don't think I could have done this with anybody else but him. Kim, owing a large part of her success to a generation that came before. Our moms played a huge role as well. Travis's mom was so precise in developing a process, and a lot of the ways that we dip and a lot of our little tricks and secrets came from, from her. And then my mom, working the store, um, she was actually washing apples as well. She's grateful they were able to enjoy her success early on. Last year, last April, uh, my mother-in-law passed away and after losing her, that was very traumatic and hurtful for our family. She was the matriarch of the family and so two weeks later, my mom passed and we weren't expecting that of, you know, either situation. We are definitely keeping them a daily part of our lives, remembering everything that they've taught us and instilled in us, um, knowing how uh, tickled they were about how far the business had come. I don't think there's a day that goes by. That we don't talk about them or think about them. A lot of times when we're doing things, we can kind of feel their peaceful spirit with us and encouraging us and pushing us. And without that, I don't know that we could continue, you know. And just like their mothers, Kim and Travis are passing down many lessons to their children. I believe some of the things that the kids have learned by watching Kim run the business is resilience, patience, love and passion. You know, a great job managing both. Apples are a true American icon. At their core, they're a shining example of innovation and versatility, and their place in U.S. history is one of patriotism and pride. But most of all, they foster a sense of togetherness. I love the city of Baltimore. I've been coming here for years, and if there's one thing I know, the city of Baltimore is serious about his crap. I love Baltimore crabs. This is the, the, the stomping ground of crabs. And I've been eating crabs since the time I could sit up at a table. It's a little spicy. 
salty and savory all in one. If I could describe the taste, you can. You just have to try it. <laughs> you just have to try it. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. When you think Maryland, you got to think blue crab, an essential part of the state's culture and cuisine. And no place knows how to cook it up quite like Baltimore. I mean, just as many ways as you can count, you can find ways to eat crab. Of course, there's your basic, your, your steamed crab with the beautiful spices, and you just start whacking that bad boy and get all that beautiful meat out. You can get cra canned crab if you'd like. Uh, of course, there's also the fabulous crab mac and cheese with a hot dog. There's the crab dip. There's your crab soup. And of course, the king of crab, the crab cake. Yes, but this is a cake that needs no icing. Mm. Crab cakes have been enjoyed by many for centuries throughout the Chesapeake region. But here in Baltimore, they're a way of life. And one of the city's most popular go-tos is tucked away just inside the world-famous Lexington Market. We're headed back to Houston today and we wanted to have the best crab cake in town. We're from Orlando, glad to be here. People have been coming to Fabies for years. Yes. Ever since I was little and I'm um, 25. <laughs> People from all around the world come here to Baltimore just to grab a bite of the famous Fadley's Crab Cake. It's made with fresh Maryland crab and family love. Everybody looks the same. How are you, my dear? Hello. Hello, hello. <laughs> Good to see you. How are you, sir? You looking good? You're looking great. Got something for you. All right. There you go. There you go. You need one of those. Oh, yeah. There you are. Now I'm feeling really crabby. Pardon me. I've, I've got to get a lawyer because there's a clause I have to have checked. <laughs> I've known the folks at Fadley's Seafood for years, but they've been serving up fresh crab cakes even longer. Hi, I'm uh, Nancy Fadley Devine. I own Fadley Seafood. It's been uh, in my family now for, well, four generations, and the fifth is coming up, so we've been around a long time. I think people are astonished to see my parents at 84 and 89 still working. You can get another five pants and do a second batch if you need to with them. People ask her for her autograph, they ask her for a picture, they ask her to hold their babies. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really fun. I mean, here's this company that's been part of Baltimore for over 130 years. Yeah, right. Uh, what, why, what, what is it about your place that has people coming back? Right. I think it's that people come in here and go right away. There's a warmth. Uh -huh. There, it's like walking to somebody's home. That's they're they're happy to have you. Uh -huh. You know, come and you feel. Oh my gosh, I feel at home. And I get people. We were here 20 years. It's exactly the same. In fact, Fadley still stands in its original location, founded here by John W. Fadley Sr. in 1886. Started off as a seafood stall, but over the generations grew into a Baltimore tradition, led by Bill and Nancy Devine along with their daughter. Damie Hahn, and I am the fourth generation of Fadley's, so I do everything. <laughs> Give them a little bit of a smorgasbord of, of everything. Going over here to fillet a fish, over here to shuck an oyster, over there to steam a crab, back here to fry, up here to make a crab cake, back down on the phone, running in the shipping department. A tray like that is about uh, let me see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight bushels of crabs in order to get that tray. That's a lot of picking, and I don't think people realize how much work 
goes into getting an all jumbo lump. Growing up, did you did you think you were going to end up here? You were going to be doing this? No, <laughs> no. But it was hard to get away from, and I couldn't see it going away. I couldn't see see it ending with my parents. So the pandemic hit. Yes. And you really had to step up. My father called me and I said, Dad, you guys cannot come in here. You know, the, we, we don't know anything about this this virus and, and the effects, especially on the elderly. And I know you want to be here, but you can't. And he said, Damien, do whatever you do, whatever you can to make payroll. It just makes me cry when I think about it. Um, he said, just make sure that we don't have to lay anybody off. I don't want to lay anybody off. I don't want anybody to lose their job. And we did it. And I saw it back when I came here in the 90s, and I still see it today. This truly is a family. Oh, it is a family. <laughs> and, it, and it's funny because I often tell people, mom and dad don't treat the employees any differently than they treat me. And that's the God's honest good, truth. <laughs> which could be a good or a bad. <laughs> that's the God's honest truth. And that's why you end up having so many multi-generation families staying here. That's right. Fadley's isn't just a family-owned business. It's run by family as well. Multiple generations of employees, father and daughter, father and son, mom and daughter, all building a home here. I've been here since a junior in high school, so I've been doing the thing for a while. I'm going to say it's been around 33, 34 years. And I started in the 79, uh, a week before my son was born. I started at 14 years old, and I'll be 42 years old in December. It's always a challenge working with family. <laughs> a lot of personalities, but you love each other and it always works, you know, it always works well. It's, what's Mom. really, really bad is when your kids are grandmothers. Mom, we were in the middle of an interview. <laughs> oh, you just broke in. <laughs> you have to start over? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> you, 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 you were saying about the challenges of working with family? <laughs> While the family spirit makes customers feel at home, it's Fadley's crab cakes that keep them coming back. What kind of oil do you cook your crab cakes in? Soybean. Soybean, thank you. So excited to have this crab And I watch people for the first time put it in their mouth and they go, oh my God. <laughs> and, I go, and they're standing at a table in a market. Yeah. They're not sitting down to a white tablecloth and having somebody serve it on a silver platter. It's on a paper plate, but it's it belongs on a silver platter. Nancy created her recipe in 1987, saying she's never changed it. So, besides yourself, how many other people know the Fadley's crab cake recipe? Sleep with her, she won't tell me. <laughs> he doesn't even know how to make a cup of coffee. <laughs> Why would I tell him? <laughs> so some people use breadcrumbs. You use it's crushed broken up saltines. Saltine. Broken saltines, yes. And not, not fine because no. you have to use more. Now, so, and then this is the magic sauce. Is this the secret sauce? Yes. So it's just enough to mix the ingredients right. together and nothing more. That's right. And the fine. big and ball of crab right there. That's it. Boom. This. Oh boy. Oh. It's just like I remember eating it 26 years ago. You know what? I'm told that all the time when people come in here. The best part about this is you haven't changed a thing. Now, this is a legacy. Well, we know how the crabs end up, but how do they get them? Let's go find out. Coming up, the generations of black watermen who've made a living pulling in Maryland's most famous catch.
The Chesapeake Bay men and women who work these waters are probably just as famous as the legendary catch that they pull out. And in fact, it's backbreaking work that is passed on from generation to generation, including blackjacks. Those were the black watermen who worked these waters all the way back into the 1800s and are a vital part of this community. The Chesapeake Bay is home to a vast variety of seafood, but none as valuable or as well known as the blue crab. The catch here makes up over a third of the nation's supply, and on average, more than 50 million pounds of blue crabs are harvested from the bay. I'm Captain Tyrone Meredith, charter boat captain, owner and operator of the Island Queen 2. Captain Meredith knows these waters well, he grew up on them. I'm the fourth generation uh, waterman, and my grand, great grandfather, he worked on the water, my grandfather, and my father. We've been here ever since the 1860s, making a living working on the Chesapeake Bay. This has been the way of life for generations of watermen here in Kent Narrows, a town just 50 miles south of Baltimore. For hundreds of years, they've caught, processed, and sold blue crabs to markets up and down the eastern shore. By the mid to late 1800s, Kent Narrows had also become one of many unlikely havens on the bay for free and enslaved African Americans. There's more black uh, watermen anywhere on the whole east coast, probably in the United States. Those watermen, also known as blackjacks, forged their path to liberation on the water. Their expertise essential to the booming seafood industry. So much so, the government granted some black watermen seamen's protection certificates, providing sailors with American citizenship and a path to economic freedom. Hey, Lewis, I'm coming up on you now. Okay, I got you. Yeah. How they biting today? This morning it did pretty good. Well, being out here is your own boss. You do what you want to do, and got nobody tell you go get me this or go get me that. Seventy-five-year-old Lewis Carter still finds that same sense of freedom on the water today. He's also one of the last generations of black watermen alive. Every morning before the sun rises, he sets out to catch crabs in the bay. I started in 1961, now bay 15, and I've been at it ever since. Right now, uh, I'm going down the line, and uh, when I get to the other end, I'll throw it off. Crabs will come up on that bait. The pressure from the water pushes them back in this dipper. Okay, these are the big, large males. You put them in one basket. That's a female with red claws. Put them in one basket. He's one of the last Mohegans left. Not too many people that still work, make a living from the water. Most of them moved away, got other jobs, and it's changing because it's harder to make a living from the bay. Crabbing season runs from spring into late fall. But changes in climate, cost, and labor have made each successive year more challenging. As younger generations take up new trades, there are less people working the waters and ultimately fewer black watermen. Back when I started, it was a plenty of black watermen, but they died out and the younger ones never taken their place. It, in, a, in one way, it makes me feel bad, you know, and I don't think it would be no chance no more black watermen. Really do Captain Meredith estimates there are fewer than a dozen black watermen on the bay. Like many of his peers, he's had to turn to other work. Back when I was crabbing teenager, I caught high as 50 bushel a day. Right now, crab is catching two or three bushel a day. Now I started running charters, fishing charters, because crabbing started declining and, and the fishing was more lucrative money-wise and educational 
His charters are an opportunity to keep stories of the blackjacks alive for generations ahead. Although tradition on these waters is changing, one thing remains the same. Nothing tastes like the Chesapeake Bay Maryland crab. It's got that certain taste to them. And, and it's the only place like that in the world is the Chesapeake Bay Blue Crab. Next, an up-and-coming Baltimore chef inspired by his family's love of cooking. Baltimore, a new generation is putting a spin on the crab cake. I'm Alex Perez. I'm the owner of Poppy Cuisine. I'm an artist at heart. So uh, cooking, um, the arts of culinary, you know, that's something that I'm very passionate about. Not necessarily having a recipe to go off of and just getting in the kitchen, freestyling and coming up with a masterpiece. It's that freestyling approach that brings people through these doors, clamoring for a taste. Jumbo, love crab, crab is king in Baltimore, so um, you're going to see crab cakes, uh, crab cake fries, crab cake egg rolls. Everyone's been going crazy over it as well. This is the ball. So I just come back for that, and I enjoy it every time I come here. We actually live in D.C., so we rode all the way up here an hour just to come here. Right now I'm drizzling our warhead and our aioli sauces on it. I have a uh, family from the Dominican Republic. I'm Afro-Latino. I'm black on my mother's side. And pretty much, I'm um, always had a love for food and uh, cooking food, eating food. So, learning how to cook from my, my dad. So my dad taught me how to cook at the age of 10. I grew up, you know, watched my grandmother cook a, a lot as well. So I started pretty much combining the uh, foods that I learned to cook from my grandmother with the foods I learned how to cook from my father. And that's kind of like how the uh, whole poppy cuisine, you know, was, was born it's in her kitchen, essentially. That was eight years ago. While working a full-time job, Alex began building a new business on the side, catering food out of his grandma's kitchen. In February 2020, he was finally able to open a restaurant. Then, the pandemic hit. Of course, you know, a month later, we get the news that we have to shut down and only do takeout. So that just opened up the, uh, the, the floodgates, essentially. And you have people standing in line 
hundreds of people <laughs> on the block in the in that mass, you know, cars double parked up and down the streets. And it was it was just may it was mayhem. During a global crisis, the city Alex was born and raised in rallied around him. Now, Poppy Cuisine is packed with locals and tourists alike. But the chef stays true to his roots, running it with close family and friends. My little sister, Natasha. Hi. <laughs> How's it going? Natasha, my big bro, Alex. I can employ family members, friends, and so forth, you know, that are people who I grew up with, people that I'm close to, and it's very rewarding, you know? Coming up, I'm gonna grab my apron and join Alex and Grandma Gloria for a lesson in cooking crab. I wanted to meet Alex and his grandma Gloria, the inspiration behind his cooking. So I dropped by their kitchen to say hello. Well, I know I picked up from my grandmother, my mother-in-law, and um, just put my own spin on certain dishes. I didn't follow it to the, the recipe to the letter. So you're able to add a little bit. Yeah, but he's always asked me uh, when I fix a dish, well, what did you put in this? How did you do, how did you do this? And I would tell him, I said, you don't have to follow to the letter, you know, put your own spin. And Alex has done just that, turning the classic crab cake into an egg roll. Genius! The ingredients, simple. A pound of jumbo lump crab, panko breadcrumbs, aged cheddar cheese, egg roll wrappers, and a couple of sauces and micro greens to top it off. There's the star of the show, the crab meat. Put on an apron, I've got rubber gloves on. All right. Patient's ready. So how do we get started, Alex? Yeah, so first what you want to do is say we have some uh, Maryland jumbo lump crab here. Uh -huh. So for the most part, I shouldn't have much shells in, but mm -hmm. I typically, uh, I like to sift through it. Just gotta see if there's any shells, and if so, you can put the shells right back in this oh. uh, container. There you go. So Gloria, did you know you were ra helping raise a, a culinary genius? <laughs> well, no, but I know he liked to eat. <laughs> <laughs> This sauce in particular is our, our crab sauce mix. Okay. So we're going to drizzle a little bit at a time. Because I don't want to put too much. Right. Just enough to uh, bind. You got enough foul? Yep. I think I'll have enough. Oh, she's she's staying by me. I like this. <laughs> I like this lady. This is why I'm so particular uh, about, you know, when I'm doing things in the kitchen. Uh-huh. Start actually rolling these things up. Yes. Why? Why? Why do you think this this recipe is, is so popular at the restaurant? The most popular. Um, well, I think uh, because it, it pretty much gives you the ability to uh, take a a bar more favorite and you know make it handheld and on on the go. Uh -huh. You know, it's throwing your hand. Kind of street food. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yes. So I think that's one of the, the biggest reasons it's it's very popular. Other than the taste as well. Right, well, exactly. You know. <laughs> yeah, because that's You can take taste. it with you, but if it's not right, taste, right, exactly. uh, come back for it. Yeah, so what we're going to um, do is uh, we're going to take like a, a pinch of uh, crab. 
it's around like a little quarter cup or so. Mm -hmm. It's gonna sit in the middle. Not too yep. much? Yeah, you wanna take a little bit out, a little pinch out. Actually, you wanna put a little bit more in. Yeah. Which is it? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that's perfect right there. That's perfect, right, perfect. <laughs> and we're gonna Just literally fold them up envelope style. What is it about cooking and family that, that, that is so important? Yeah, I think uh, for me, um, you know, living a, a busy life as a business owner and a dad, a husband, and things like that. Mm -hmm. I feel like uh, food is a uh, opportunity for family to come together, you know, talk about things, especially if you haven't seen each other in a long time. And mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's a way for us to connect, so. Yeah. Lord, is, it, is it true you've never done this before? No, I haven't. It's true. Oh. Could have fooled me that you never did this before. Look at that. <laughs> Bam! Done! Faster than I did. Wow! <laughs> <laughs> wow, that natural grandma thing. Love it. So now we're gonna get get the deep fryer up here and fry these bad boys up. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Woo! You have to describe the heart of your cuisine. What is it, and and how does Baltimore uh, kind of part of that? Pretty much my my story, and uh, I think that connects very well to our Baltimore. You know because. You know, I, I grew up here, you know, all my life, and I think everything that um, I faced during the time that, you know, I, I started this company up until now, I've been transparent about, and it resonated very well with the uh, the, uh, the people in Baltimore, and they, they watched my journey through the years, and I feel like that's that's really the, the heart of what mm -hmm. I do. Make sure and the around the edges and then things like that, so that's why I keep turning them, you know, so it doesn't fry uh -huh. on one particular side too much. And, Want to even fry? Mm. Nice and golden. So you want to cut these diagonally. So, yeah. so I'm going to drizzle. This is our aioli sauce, house made, and this is our warhead sauce right here. <laughs> so the sauce is kind of sweet, has a tangy bite to it. Oh, kind of like Gloria. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's right. Well, I guess there's only thing, one thing left to do. Yeah, and that's Try the piece. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Crab cake egg roll. Yeah. Here we go. Wow. Chef Hawk, you have done Baltimore proud. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Our time here in Baltimore is coming to an end. We tried the traditional crab cake. Tasted a modern spin with crab cake egg rolls and even went straight to the source on the Chesapeake Bay. At the center of it all, one thing still ringing true, food tastes better when you eat it with family. When most of us think about Detroit, Motown, car manufacturing, even sports comes to mind. But when it comes to food, the folks here in the Motor City are all about one famous Frank the Coney Dog. And no, we're not talking about Coney Island in New York. In Michigan, a Coney is both a diner to locals and a hot dog smothered in chili, topped with onions, and finished off with a <laughs> of mustard. Now, there are dozens of Coneys in the Detroit metro area. Some bear the Coney Island name, others don't. But you'll always find some type of sausage, a bun, and a signature meat sauce on the menu. So, what makes Michigan crazy for Coneys? Let's find out. The relationship be between Coney's and Detroit, it's a long relationship. It's a long love story. <laughs> the Coney is, is a part of Detroit. If you can drive and eat a Coney, it's not a... The island have been dishing up this local specialty for more than 100 years. In fact, this restaurant and the one next door, well, they've got a shared history. But American has been run by the same family for three generations, founded by a Greek immigrant. This restaurant story is synonymous with the legendary hot dog of this city. What do you say we go meet the family? One to go plain, one fry. At American Coney Island, hot dogs aren't just a meal, they're memories. Grace Kiros is the third generation owner of this legendary spot. Grace. Al. Hi, good to see oh, you right. again. Good to see it's been you. a long time. It has. We sat down to talk Coney traditions, turning points, and of course, Toppings. 
people are very passionate about their Coney Island hot dog. Here. Yes, they are. Why? Because it holds a nostalgia and a tradition to them. We see daily generations of people coming in here. Remember grandpa bringing them, my mom brought me. It, it's part of their growing up, it's part of their life. 30 years ago, Grace took over the restaurant reins from her dad, Chuck Kiros. Chuck inheriting the business from his father, founder Constantine Kiros, AKA Gust. Your place, this place on this corner has been here for 105 years. What is it like being really part of the fabric of, of an iconic city like Detroit? It's surreal. I mean, I think back to my grandfather and my dad and the things they saw here from, from riots to Tigers winning the World Series when they were good. Such a deep history and, and proud. Mm -hmm. I love this city. The Coney craze in Detroit is really a legacy of the Kiros family. Historian Joe Grimm co-writing the book on Coney's in the Motor City. The Kiroses came to Detroit from Dara in Greece, where this was a sheep herding town, and they needed to find work. And they really struck gold, as in the color of mustard, when they started making these Coney Island hot dogs. In the late 1800s, Greece was facing a massive economic crisis, setting off a wave of global migration. By 1920, it's estimated that over 400,000 Greeks immigrated to the United States seeking new opportunities. Like most European immigrants of the era, they passed through New York before moving on to other parts of the country. They entered, most of them, through Ellis Island, which is near Coney Island. They saw people on Coney Island and in New York eating hot dogs and said, ah, we're gonna go into the hot dog business, but we're gonna top it with something Greek. Now, the true origins, like who invented the Coney dog, lost to history. It just sort of happened in a lot of places in about the same time, mostly by Greek immigrants. Gust and his brother, Bill Kuros, opening one of Detroit's first Coney shops in the early 1900s. A family rift caused the brothers to split, leading to side-by-side -side Coney operations and a long-lasting restaurant rivalry. Detroiters swearing allegiance to American or Lafayette, but only American is still owned by the Kiros family today. We figure well more than 100 Coney Islands can trace their lineage directly to that flat top grill. Each Coney spot in the Detroit area and throughout Michigan has its own history from national to Kirby's, to Nicky D's, from Berkeley Coney Island, to L. George's, to Leo's, and more. But all of the city's Coney's have a similar foundation, starting with a steamed bun. You add a beef and pork hot dog. Then it's covered with a chili sauce. And the chili sauce is where Coney owners can improvise and innovate. And then on top of that, it's going to be a yellow salad mustard and diced onions and never any ketchup. If you put ketchup on a Coney dog, you might get thrown out of the restaurant. Definitely a controversial condiment here. Definitely no ketchup. But I see ketchup behind. Is we that... sell french fries. When customers come to the carryout and want, you know, I'll have a Coney with everything. Every once in a while you get, okay, I want ketchup on mine too. We don't do it. We refuse to put the ketchup on the hot dog. And we've gotten people so good, a little upset with us. I'm like, Dude, I'm not putting ketchup on the hot dog. Your, your grandfather immigrates here from, from, from Greece. Greece. Why hot dogs? It was something that he had seen when he landed at Ellis Island in New York. He saw, you know, the amusement park. You gotta remember, he was a young man, came over with no money, I mean, borrowed a pair of shoes. He heard the automotive business was hiring in Detroit, made his way to Detroit, thinking they'll hire me even though I don't know how to read or write. They didn't on this little corner right here where we are now, he started a little push cart. You know, we're Greek, right? We know food. So grandpa remembered the hot dogs, made a Greek chili sauce. Our chili is a little unique. You hear about a Coney Island hot dog. You yes. think about Nathan's in New York City. But here's the difference. I'm gonna stop you. Okay. A Coney Island in New York is an amusement park right. that sells hot dogs. In Detroit, a Coney Island is the actual, it's the, hot dog with the chili mustard onions on it. That's the difference. And I got a lot of heated arguments with people about that. Really? In Detroit, it is the actual thing you're eating, thanks to my grandpa, because he named it American Coney Island. He was so grateful he was in America and all the opportunities were given to him. Grace now in charge of carrying on the family legacy. 
It's obviously been passed from generation to yes. generation here. But each time you lose a member of the generation, it, it's got to be tough. You just lost your dad. Yes. Uh, not too long ago. Yeah, six months ago. When you come in, do you feel him here? I do. I, I Yes, I do. And I feel a sense of pride. I miss him a lot, obviously. But I, I just feel his presence. I feel everything he, he taught me. My grandpa did his thing. Then once my dad stepped in and took over, he took it to the next level. Then I took it to a whole nother level, with my brother's help included. Grace's brother, Chris Soderopoulos, helps run the business today. There's an American outpost at the Detroit Zoo, plus a new location in Las Vegas. They're also shipping Coney kits all across the country. You get everybody yeah. from all walks of life, exactly. every demographic, every racial component, everybody it, comes here. Yes. The American Coney is the great equalizer. It, that's, I love the way you put it that way, Al. exactly. We love the, our customers. I mean, our customers are like family, it's no joke. This is who made us. So we treat you like family, we don't know any different. Coming up, I learned how to make the quintessential Coney. One up! Ready, there, are. nice shot. Hey. At American Coney Island, the oldest family-run Coney spot in Detroit, they keep things traditional. But you know, as I look at your menu, and I look at the pictures, they're uh, vi vintage, let's That's say. It doesn't look like you have strayed that much from the original menu. We haven't. I, I won't. Why add to it when it's working? You know what else is working? Me. I got behind the grill with Grace to prep the perfect plate of Coney's. This is the proprietary hot dog. If you notice the natural casing, yes, it's a 90% beef, 10% pork with a lamb skin casing. That's that, like three meats in one. You exactly. Get. Pork, beef, and, a, and that's lamb. That's right. And that's what makes it pop. Like when you bite into it, oh, it snaps snap. like a party in your mouth. Yes. yes. That detail kept popping up everywhere we went. It's a warm bun. It's the, it's the snap of the hot dog. When you bite it, you hear that pop. You can tell it's a natural casing because when you bite it, it snaps back at you. The steamer bun. Ah. And That's they, what we were taught. They're in a oh, steamer. You know, there's steamer. just enough steam in mm -hmm. here. So you're going to pull out the bun. Right. Look, look for the cut. Yep. So open it up a little. Grab your plate. Yes. All right. So we're going to grab one. Right. Come over here. Do you want to top it or do you want to I want to watch the top. Okay. Give it a little mix. Little, this is that. Little zhuzh. Greek, yeah, that's right. It gets a little messy. Some chili. Add a little more. You know, mm -hmm. be cheap with the chili. Greek spices. Yes. That's the magic. The secret spice blend? Well, it's secret. But the chili is made with ground beef. The tangy mustard. Tangy. Just a little lime, nothing nothing more. You take some onions, sprinkle them across, and there you go. Boom, okay. 105 years. 105 years of magic. That's... My turn. Get a plate. I need one up, which means I one. need one for a customer. One for Everything a customer. Everything on it, chili, mustard, onions. Get the split. Open it up a little more, Al. A little All more. Right, it's not too bad. Okay. <laughs> Boom. 
All right, now I come over here. Keep the mud open because you want oh, the chili oh, to go in. Oh, you want the there. chili to go in. Yeah, you want the chili. You want it. Yeah. You want that you chili. Don't chintz out on that yeah, chili. Really, don't chintz on the chili. Turn your dish a little so it's easier for uh, you to pour over there. All right. There. Oh, that really it does have a creamy See, consistency. See, it's really creamy, right? Exactly. And mustard. There you go. Ooh, that's heavy mustard. Did they order heavy mustard? Um, no, they didn't. <laughs> I, I'm making this for myself. <laughs> exactly. There you go. All right. One up. Ready. There, yeah, nice shot. Yeah. Awesome. Woo. Good job, Al. Hey, now. Life-changing experience. Mm. It's magic in your mouth. Every great Coney needs a great bun, but not just any bun will do. A few miles from downtown Detroit is another family-run institution that's keeping the Coney tradition alive. What started as a small baking business is now one of the state's biggest suppliers of Coney buns. And that bun is the Coney Island Steamer. That's a good bun. The Coney Island Steamer is a six inch hot dog bun. At Metropolitan Baking Company, they like big buns and they cannot lie. The Coney Island Steamer Bun is our flagship item on the bun and roll line. Not to mention, they claim to have buns of steel. These buns sit in a steam table. The product's formulated for that steam table. That bun is going to sit there and it's not going to fall apart on you when you load it with all those condiments. In Michigan, Coney dogs aren't just a tasty meal. They're big business. The Coney business gave rise to supplier industries just as the auto industry did. So we need to have a major bun maker here. The big maker nowadays is Metropolitan Bakery and they bake these Coney dog buns with the sponge dough method. For three generations, the Cordes family, who also traced their roots back to Greece, has risen to the occasion selling specialty breads. Metropolitan Baking Company was founded by my grandfather in 1945. In the beginning, Metropolitan only sold simple loads. Today, they produce dozens of items for grocery stores, high-end restaurants, and of course, Coney Diners. And while their products have changed over the years, a few names have truly stood the test of time. He was George James Cordes, uh, namesake, and my father is James George Cordes, and I'm George James Cordes. My father and just like me, it was, it was, it was bred in the business. George credits his father for the company's massive expansion in the mid 80s. This summer, we're gonna be producing millions of Coney Island steamer hot dog buns. This abundance 
pun intended, is all thanks to automation. Automation is, is really what transformed this company. We went from packaging maybe 10, 15 loaves of bread a minute to 140 loaves a minute. In 2001, after years of recipe testing, the signature steamer bun was added to the product line. It is a hot dog bun that we've formulated to be used at the Coney Island restaurants um, in Metro Detroit specifically. This bun that we produce is in roughly 95% of all Coney Island restaurants. And it takes a lot of dough to make all those buns. So what we're doing right now, this is where it all begins. This is the mixing room, and we're about to create a 1,600 pound dough batch of hot dog buns. Major ingredients are gonna be flour is 65%, you know, then you've got your yeast, you've got your sugar, you've got your oil, you know, and a bunch of, bunch of proprietary ingredients. Any minute. That's um, roughly 1,200 packages of Coney Island steamer hot dog buns. There you go, you did it. <laughs> that makes over 14,000 buns. After mixing, the dough gets cut into bun-sized portions. You're looking at three-foot sheets that were just guillotined, and now they're going into a smaller divider to be put into roughly uh, 1.25 ounce dough balls. Next up, time to proof. After 60 minutes, the dough has risen. And after about 10 minutes bake time, we're gonna have a fully baked hot dog bun that's prepared to cool. The buns are almost ready. The product's sliced you know, after the cooling conveyor. And then it's paddled on top of each other to create a 12 pack, a dozen buns. The baskets are headed down to logistics and ready to be set up for routes. Then it's off to stores in Michigan's finest Coney restaurants, including American Coney Island. While the factory may have a lot of machinery, George has always been hands-on. So I worked here every summer throughout high school and throughout college, almost every position. And you really learn what hard work is as a kid to work in a bread factory you know, when it's 110 degrees out. When Grandpa George started the company, he had fewer than 10 employees. Today, they've got almost 100. When they say employees, family and family employees, that's for John. He's literally family. John Grabowski has worked with all three generations of the Cordes family. At 12 years old, he took a summer job washing buckets at Metropolitan. Today, he's the plant's lead engineer. It's like family. When you come to this business, everybody that's here, they feel like family to me. Everybody says hello to each other. It's a good camaraderie. Everybody likes each other. It's more than just bread and butter for the employees. It's really nice being run by a family on business. It, you can come to work and feel like you're at home. It's like a second family to me. We all work together, we, you know, we get down in the dirt, you know, we exchange uh, all kinds of work habits, and we learn from each other, and we do the best we can. The longtime employees are proud, keeping Detroit's Coney tradition going strong. We all grew up eating Coney's, right? Comerica Park, you know, baseball games as a kid with mom and dad and the grandparents, family time. Coney dogs go... That's a part of pretty much everybody's childhood. It's a joy to be a part of that heritage. Today, Metropolitan's running six days a week, 20 hours a day. The amount of product that we're sending out each day, from the first dough that's kicking out around 1.30 in the morning till the final package at 10 at night, I feel constant pride. As for the future, George's kids seem to have inherited his love for the bakery. My daughters, Cecile and Sloan, I, I bring them almost every Saturday. They actually tell me that they enjoy it more than Disney World. And this is their favorite place on earth, just like what it was for me as a kid that age. It's that joy and a family legacy that George hopes will carry on for many years to come. I absolutely love what we're doing here. I love our history. I never want to be that third generation cliche. You know, I want to continue the growth with my kids, or my kids' kids, have them look back, family members, and say, wow, that's incredible. Look at what you've done.
chili, mustard, onion. What happens if you reverse it? <laughs> oh, you're out. You're out. You're out. You're out. <laughs> Minutes from downtown is Detroit's Brush Park neighborhood. Folks here are flocking to enjoy the good vibes at this cool county spot. CMO may be relatively new to the game, but loyal fans can't get enough of their chili, mustard, and onions. CMO, get it? But unlike most diners in town, here, the coney, the sauce, and everything else on the menu is powered by plants. My name is Pete Lacombe. I'm the owner of Chili Mustard Onions in Detroit, Michigan. You could say opening a vegan coney spot in the coney capital takes guts and grit. And that's exactly what this family's made of. I don't follow any rules. I follow the important ones, but I don't do what everybody else does. Pete and his wife, Shelly, along with their daughter, Darla, launching CMO in 2018. It's the first and only all vegan coney spot in Detroit. I would say my wife gave me the biggest kick in the butt to go vegan, and we did. I had a vision that we were gonna open a vegan Coney Island, and I told Pete that, and he told me I was out of my mind. Pete and Shelly have enjoyed many a traditional Coney as lifelong Detroit residents. When Shelly and I got married, she used to tell me all the time that I was gonna open a restaurant, and it was gonna be a vegan restaurant, and I said, yeah, I'm not vegan. So I asked her why she thought I was gonna open a vegan restaurant. She said, you could never hurt an animal or sell animals. And I went, ah, oh, you're so right. Now, the family's been vegan for over 10 years. It not only saved my life going vegan and saved my life by doing something I love, um, I got to do something I love every single day with the people I love. Before entering the restaurant business, Pete worked in the auto industry, just like his dad and his granddad. When I was in automotive design, I ate horribly. I smoked cigarettes, I drank a lot. It was just kind of the norm in that field. That was really in my blood, but it wasn't in my soul. Cooking was in my soul. Pete's true passion coming from spending time with family in the kitchen. So we lived really close to my grandparents and what was in my soul was food. I cooked with my grandmas all the time. My grandma, my mom's mom, really should have opened a restaurant. And um, I feel like I'm living that dream through her. That dream now possible with the next generation. So Darla's our manager and she takes care of the customers so well. And seeing the woman that she has become, we're so proud of her. My wife and I, we've been through so much. We're partners in crime, partners in life, partners in love. And partners in creating a home away from home for every customer. I created CMO, the interior, to reflect like my basement or my living room where you can come over and eat at my house. Everybody's welcome in my home. Every day, somebody wants to go tell him how fabulous this place is and how blown away they are with this food. Since it first opened, CMO has been delighting vegans and non-vegans alike with their take on hot dogs smothered in chili. The amount of love and emotion that is put into the food and every bite you can tell that. I've never had vegan food, but it was really, really good. This just tastes so similar to the wood as a, a regular Pony Island. You know, it's hard to come by something that's like so close to like a childhood favorite. Of course, I had to see if this Coney truly lived up to the hype. Hey, Al. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Welcome to my kitchen. Well, this is really cool. We've heard all about this. When you're used to something that is neat, yeah. you know, getting them to try something that doesn't quite fit what they think it's supposed to be. For me, I let my food speak. If I put something out there on a plate that is incredible, happens to be vegan, that, that changes minds and hearts and, you know, it's incredible. I see your, your, your wife and your daughter standing out there. Are they taste testers? Oh, my wife for sure, yes. That's love. It is, oh, it's love. <laughs> and we'll be married 30 years this year. Congratulations. So. Thank you. Let's make some vegan magic. Let's do that. The, the hot dog, what kind of protein is this? It's a pea and soy protein. And this is your chili. What's yes. The, now, what's the protein in here? This is chili? Beyond uh, Crumble, uh -huh. a plain Beyond Crumble. A lot of Coney places are hush-hush about their chili, but Pete was willing to dish a little. How do you make your chili? 
I use a blend of spices, salt, pepper, garlic, onion, and a few other things that are top secret. <laughs> We're gonna throw that in our water. Okay. That's the hero right there. Right there. The spice is the hero. The chili's brought to a boil, then thickened with potato starch. It was time to try my first vegan coney. That's a healthy ladle. It is. I usually do a little more than that. Wow. So, yeah. Do a lot of onions. Here they are. Let's give that a shot. That's really good. Especially the chili. Thank you. How long did you have to work on the chili recipe? You know, I, I hit it right on the head when we first went vegan, mm -hmm. and then I didn't write it down. <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> So then it took me about a year after that to really nail it down. But even with a winning recipe, times have been tough for CMO. What was the pandemic like for you guys? It hit us extremely hard and we're still struggling and fighting and you know, there's no quit in us, but it's been tough. Yeah. How's the future look for you? I really don't know. We're, we're trying, we're working every day, but I, I don't know what the future holds. I really don't. If it's based on the taste of that, your future's bright, my friend. Thank you so much. I that is good. It. Thanks so wow. much. Wow. The history behind Detroit's Coney Dog is truly an all-American tale, from the Greek immigrants who borrowed the name to a mashup of traditional flavors with a boardwalk staple. And now, there's a whole generation of locals who are ensuring that this regional hot dog is here to stay. Oh, oh, hi there. Craig Melvin here, filling in for Al Roker on this episode of Family Style. And today, well, today we're talking, talking all about one of the country's most popular desserts and a holiday staple. We're talking about pie. And as a, a southerner and a pie lover, pecan, pecan here, it's my favorite, not pecan, pecan. So this assignment was almost too good to be true. From our Thanksgiving tables to our 4th of July barbecues to Christmas and the winter holidays, pie is central to so many of our celebrations. Homemade or baked at, at wonderful shops like this one called Michelle's Pies in Connecticut. Americans sure have strong fillings for pie. See what I did there? But how did we become a nation of pie people? Join me as I slice into the significance of this iconic dessert and piece together how and why different pies are so important to communities across this country. Mm. Time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're gonna to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. Yes, pecan might be my favorite, but this, this is my second favorite. I'm a huge fan of a good old fashioned sweet potato pie. And I'm not alone. For millions of black Americans, making a sweet potato pie is a meaningful tradition this time of year. And in Minneapolis, one woman stopped selling her highly sought after sweet potato pie and with the help of her family, started giving them away for free. Now, through her nonprofit, she is bringing generations together to bake and then gift her tasty pies. It's a recipe for spreading love and creating meaningful connections. You could say they're baking the world a better place. Here's to the joy of our blackness, our beauty, ooh, our energy, our power. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just being able to come together in unity. Onward. 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 That's Rose McGee, the founder of the Sweet Potato Comfort Pie. On a fall morning, a group of women gathered at her home just outside Minneapolis. I appreciated young Brittany Wright uh, approaching me and saying, Ms. Ms. Rose, you really should teach us young women how to make sweet potato pie. I'll just take a little piece of the shell itself and just slide it in there and that'll pull it right out a lot easier than trying to use a spoon because it's thicker. 
passing a tradition from one generation to the next. Mama Rose is really good at bringing people together, making them feel welcome and having a sense of belonging. And so I thought it'd be really cool on my birthday to bring a bunch of women together, sharing experiences, learning how to bake pies, learning something from the African-American tradition. Each attendee will be making three pies to share with their community, one to keep, one to gift to an elder, and one to gift to someone younger than them. Once we got the first batch of sweet potatoes boiling, I started exhaling. When you peel, always go to the tip, and then it just pulls right off. For Rose, sweet potato pod is not just dessert, it's a catalyst for connection, one that she considers sacred. It seems like it's all about the pie, but really the pie just happens to be the sweet spot that brings people together. I used to sell the pies years ago. No idea that one day I would feel compelled to give them away. Not to sell them, but to give them away. I started Sweet Potato Comfort Pie in 2014, not really realizing that that's what I was doing. After the killing, of young Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri. And I was sitting there watching television. I felt this calling. I obeyed that calling and made about 30 pies, packed them in my car, and my son Adam drove down with me. But what I discovered was people wanted to be heard and listened to. They wanted to feel that um, they were being respected. So I took that to heart and brought it back home. Back in Minneapolis, when George Floyd was killed, Rose stayed up all night baking pies to take to the memorial site to help her own community heal. And I didn't know what to do except make some pies. And that's why I know it's, it's, it's not just about me. It's bigger than that. Is anybody really going to respond to that? And people do. The organization's mission is to strengthen and cultivate relationships with the solidarity and story sharing that is part of making and receiving the pie. I'm not trying to over emotionalize anything, <laughs> but I will say it's something when people allow you to feel purpose mm -hmm. and allow you to see That's beauty it. within yourself. The sweet potato pie we know today was inspired from West African cuisine and dates back centuries. To get to the root of its origins, we must first talk about yams. I'm Rossi Nastapulo. I'm the author of Sweet Land of Liberty, A History of America in 11 Pies. So a yam is an old world crop and a sweet potato is a new world crop. And so yams are really an important part of the West African diet. Whereas sweet potatoes, they are grown kind of on this side of the world. In the United States, sweet potatoes grew abundantly in the South. Enslaved black Americans tended to these crops and cooked with them, contributing to many of the sweet potato recipes we know today. However, credit to black chefs and cooks didn't come until the late 1800s. There was Melinda Russell's A Domestic Cookbook and then Abby Fisher's What Mrs. Fisher Knows About Old Southern Cooking. And so these are two black authored cookbooks that included recipes for sweet potato pie and really were an opportunity for these black chefs and cooks to reclaim their knowledge and have the credit given to them. When emancipation comes, they continue to make sweet potato pie and this time they're making it for themselves, their families and their communities. So you're just gonna put in a third of the way. For those close to the sweet potato comfort pie, it's what's in the batter that really truly matters. Antoinette Pearson Edinger is a pastry chef and helps manage the kitchen at sweet potato comfort pie gatherings. I was at the first meeting in here in Rose's living room. When I was growing up, if there were some trauma in a family or some celebration in a family, you went down the street with the pies in your hand to present to the family that was either in need or is celebrating and communicate with the folks that are there. She, oh, the pies are ready. <laughs> Today, back in Rose's kitchen is one of those celebrations in honor of Brittany's birthday. What I appreciate about this, we have been in responsive mode. We try to respond to these crises 
that happen across the country and locally. So to do something more celebratory is very uplifting and very inspiring for us all. It's a sisterhood through these pies, through Mama Rose, we're able to celebrate each other, empower each other, encourage each other, and we're doing it in a way through unity. The future of sweet potato comfort pie, I believe is a good one. Everybody has this need of wanting to connect. And when you're baking a pie, you just, you're gonna connect. The heart of the comfort pie connection is love and a commitment to greater good. And of course, always keeping their eyes on the pie. When in doubt, bring a bunch of black women into the kitchen and we'll figure it out. Coming up, a family in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, whose ancestors helped invent a sticky dessert that's still being served up today. And welcome back to Family Style. And another pie rich with history and a little sugar as well. Some say the origin of this pie known as shoe fly can be traced back to a cake, specifically the Centennial Cake. It first appeared in Philadelphia circa 1876, celebrating the 100th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. And while the exact origins of the shoe fly pie are lost to time, no matter how you slice it, it is a true American original. In the heart of Pennsylvania's bucolic Amish country lies a town with a name that sounds like a familiar adage. Burton Hand is nestled in Lancaster County. A lot of farming, a lot of agriculture, and a lot of really good, hardworking people. It just has a peaceful and calm feeling. It just envelops you. Bird in Hand isn't just the name of this small village, it's also the namesake of a family-owned corporation that runs a group of lodges, a campground, and eateries. John Smucker runs the business. Under his wings, the Bird in Hand Bakery and Cafe, best known for its shoe fly pie. Raised Mennonite, John and his wife Myrna have deep roots in this neck of the woods. My family's story in Pennsylvania begins in 1752 when my immigrant ancestor Christian Schmucker uh, emigrated from Switzerland and Germany, came to America, established a farm homestead here in Lancaster County. And I'm the eighth generation. Pennsylvania Dutch refers to immigrants who came to the U.S. from German-speaking countries in the 18th and 19th centuries, mainly to escape religious persecution in Europe. By the late 1700s, it's estimated that these immigrants accounted for more than a third of Pennsylvania's population. Well, that'd be the new farmer. He's out there doing it. John's ancestors, along with countless others, brought with them new types of cuisine and 
helped invent that sticky dessert that's famous in this region, shoe fly pie. The origins of shoe fly pie are a little bit murky. One historian traces it back to Centennial Cake, which was made in the 1800s as a celebration of Pennsylvania's centennial. Shoe fly pie, an apple pan, and out it makes your eyes light up. And so that was a crustless version that then once it becomes placed in a crust, it become more easily transportable. That turns into shoe fly pie. The Smucker family has been serving up their family shoe fly pie to the public for more than 50 years. And they've been baking it for much longer. But what exactly is shoe fly pie? I'd start with delicious. The topping is different, so it's not so sweet pecan pie with no pecans. <laughs> shoe fly pie is a type of molasses pie. It's really a product of Pennsylvania Dutch cuisine, and it's distinguished by its inclusion of streusel, which is very classic to those types of European cuisines. On the frontier, they had a limited amount of ingredients, a limited amount of resources, and so one of the products that they would have had was molasses, and molasses was stable. Most shoe fly pies include molasses, the smuckers, however, do things a little differently. We do not use a molasses product for our shoe fly pie. We gravitate towards a light table syrup. Another unique feature of shoe fly pie, the traditional ingredients don't require refrigeration, making it a convenient treat for the many Amish residents in this part of the country. That's Anna Mary Smucker, or to those who knew and loved her, Grussy. Uh, my grandmother, Anna Mary Smucker, was the one who I would say was the ultimate pie baker in our family. I'm sure she picked up recipes from her mother who picked them up from her mother before that. In a 1938 edition of National Geographic on the Pennsylvania Dutch, Grussy was even featured with four of her kids, including John's dad and a shoe fly pie. John comes from a long line of bakers, influenced by his grandparents and his parents. My mother was a pie baker, so she was a busy cook and a housekeeper. And my father was out on the farm and doing different businesses, and so she uh, was busy in the kitchen taking care of the family. In 1970, John's father, Paul, opened the family's first restaurant. There, they started serving the family's signature pie to locals and tourists. In the mid-80s, John opened another nest for foodies, Bird in Hand Bakery and Cafe, just to keep up with the soaring demand for their baked goods. Pumpkin pie, shoe fly pie, and cherry crumb pie. Ah, I just love pies. The pies here are all made from scratch, including the ooey gooey wet bottom shoe fly, using Smucker's recipe that's been passed down for generations. And apparently, this pie isn't just for dessert, I have it for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, uh, not necessarily every day. What's delicious on the plate first needs to take shape. And we like our shoe fly pies to be sweet and smooth. There are two main components, the goo and the crumbs. The wet filling is made with hot water, light table syrup, light brown sugar, baking soda, and eggs. It's stirred with a canoe paddle-sized kitchen tool. So to us, the goo is one of the most important features of the pies. That filling is poured into a homemade pie crust. The pie's signature crumb topping is made with pastry flour, light brown sugar, cinnamon, salt, and shortening, which is combined in a large mixer. Crumbs go on top, and then this goo is down below in a layer that's about a half an inch thick. When we bake it, the crumbs work down through into the pie a bit and um, help to create what I call that middle layer. Back when Grussy made her pies, she didn't shoo the grandkids away. She just let us dig in. After about an hour in the oven, the pies are cooled, covered, and carried right from the kitchen to the bakery. While visitors to this bakery savor unforgettable flavors and a pinch of the past, for John and his family, the pies are symbolic of so much more. My grandmother would always say, give good measure. She was a very hospitable person. I see pies as part of hospitality. These folks are proudly carrying on a unique Pennsylvania Dutch tradition here in the land known as Bird and Hand. Coming up, 
a New York City baker's quest to bring back a long lost Christmas time pie. today, gone tomorrow. That's what, that's what seemed to be the fate of a beloved bygone Christmas time pie. It was popular for, well, a New York minute. Well, I guess a few decades to be exact. But today, one bakery in New York City is bringing back this long forgotten chestnut rum and cherry creation called Nestle Road. It's not your traditional pumpkin, apple, or, or blueberry dessert, but it is a treat that many older New Yorkers probably remember from childhood. Served up with a slice of nostalgia and a memory of decadent New York. Our motto at Petey's is damn fine pie for damn fine people <laughs> because we're just so proud to be a New York business. Pie has been a part of New York's culinary history the entire time and we just wanted to elevate it the best we could. I'm Petra Paredes and I am the owner and head baker of Petey's Pie Company. Petey's Pie, named after Petra's childhood nickname, has been serving up damn fine pie since opening in New York City in 2014. We opened up the Tuesday before Thanksgiving. We sold like 100 pies. And then the next year, we sold 1,000 pies. This past Thanksgiving, nearly a decade after opening, Petey's sold 10,000 pies. The big holiday rush isn't new to Petra. She grew up pulling all-nighters before Thanksgiving in the name of pie. Pie has been part of my life since I was born. I was born into my parents' bakery. <laughs> they have a bakery called Mom's Apple Pie Company in Virginia. And I always spent my Thanksgivings working at their shop. They are still in business and they still do tremendous Thanksgiving business. Petra inherited a love of baking from her dad. My dad is really obsessive about quality of ingredients and that's something that I have learned from him to just be really focused on flavor and on like the texture and balance in a pie. Petra left the family pie business and moved to New York City to pursue a career in teaching. It was at the end of my first year of teaching that I met my husband, Robert. Seemingly, against all odds, it was poker that brought Petra back to pie. He, interestingly enough, was playing poker <laughs> professionally at the time. He wanted a place to invest his poker money. <laughs> and so I sort of half-jokingly asked him if he wanted to open a pie bakery with me. Robert didn't call her bluff. And he said yes 
We'd been dating a few weeks <laughs> at the time, and we spent the next three years planning it. Petey's menu offers the classics like apple, banana cream, key lime, and also a beloved bygone pie. The couple's love of culinary history led to Nestle Road's discovery and return. One of the things that Robert and I used to do as we were planning our business was we would look at the New York Public Library's menu database, which is really fun. And one pie that we kept seeing over and over that we had never heard of and never tried and weren't sure how to pronounce <laughs> was Nestle Road Pie. It was on a lot of sort of mid-century menus from the 1940s through the 1960s. This elusive pie piqued Petra's interest. Stumbling across Nestle Road on these old menus was sort of like uh, discovering a fossil or something. Petra saw this as a chance to bring back a piece of decadent New York. Her curiosity inspired a sweet revival. Nestle Road wasn't always a pie. It actually started as a frozen custard dessert in sort of the Victorian ages. It's a very decadent thing to have a frozen dessert before, you know, refrigeration was widely available. It was like the most fancy dessert you could imagine. First off, it was named after a Russian diplomat by his private French chef. Not to mention its luxurious ingredients of chestnuts and liqueur. Years later, the Big Apple heavily influenced the evolution of this decadent dessert. It went from a pudding mold to a pie crust. It sort of transformed in New York City in around the 1940s by this woman named Hortense Spire. Baking the pies from her Upper West Side brownstone, the pie quickly gained popularity. She made pies for like all of the fancy New York City restaurants, all the steakhouses and all the fancy fish seafood restaurants. The pie was a mid-century marvel. As demand grew and the pie became a New York City diner and sweet shop staple, many renditions no longer included chestnuts. By the mid-60s, it all but faded into oblivion. Nestle Road is one of Petey's holiday season offerings, but the supply is limited. Because it's so labor intensive, we can only make 80 over the course of the week. In creating her Nestle Road pie recipe, Petra sought to honor the origins of the dessert. I wanted to bring that chestnut uh, part of the flavor profile and bring it sort of front and center. My recipe is almost sort of a mashup of the sort of Hortense Spire 1940s era and the New York Diner 1960s era. All of Petey's pies start with the same crust. My crust is based on my dad's recipe. It pushes the limits with one ingredient. My crust recipe has like a eight to nine ratio of butter to flour, which is really high. Next up, preparing the chestnuts for roasting. I puree the chestnuts with sugar and with rum, and that is sort of the base note flavor of the whole pie. The filling's light, delicate texture is achieved using gelatin. It's sort of like a, a chiffon or like a fluffy custard kind of pie. The filling is then chilled. We did like a Swiss meringue. The meringue is folded into the filling. Time to top with ganache. And of course, the final step, a cherry on top. They're actually sour cherries. When I hear that somebody um, who hasn't tried Nestle Road Pie since, they, since the 1960s tried my Nestle Road Pie and loved it and just got a sense of nostalgia out of it, it really sort of brings a, a whole other layer of meaning into, into the work that I do. Outside of the bakery, Petra and Robert are raising three little pie people with a fourth on the way. My kids are really into pie. They really love to eat pies. As for if their kids will share a slice of the shop one day. Who knows if they'll want to continue the pie business. I look forward to passing on everything that I know, just like my parents did, and, um, and seeing if they're interested.
For most Americans, it seems that there's always room for pie. And the significance of that slice can adapt to circumstances, places, and people. Through pie, it seems we can more deeply understand not 